so much. Uh, good morning again. My name is Sadi Farah. I'm the chair of the engineering department. Uh, on behalf of the engineering department, we really like to thank you for coming here today and joining our 2017-18 senior design project. Uh, the engineering capstone project is a two-semester course, and uh, each team of the students is required to complete a fully functional product. Each team must first find an advisor, a customer, and then later they have to write their own funding proposal. After they receive funding for their project, they can start working on the project and actually develop it. This year, we are happy to tell you that we have 17 senior, uh, seven, uh, 17 students, or seven teams of senior design projects. And these guys have been working uh, on these projects for the past nine months. So all of these projects officially started in August. Some of them actually, the basic idea started May of last year, right after the senior design project of the previous class. So they've been really, really working hard on these uh, projects. In fact, last, this week, I mean, almost every night, I think Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they have been in the lab till at least I know till 11 or 11 p.m. I don't know, anyone stay longer than that? <laughs> yes. Oh, I see. <laughs> so, um, I, I really want to thank all of our students for working so hard and trying to finish their, uh, their projects and uh, you know, making it ready and getting ready for the presentation. Um, we hope you enjoyed the presentation and uh, you get a chance to speak to everyone and look at the demos right after the break. Uh, uh, as you know, all of these students are ready to hit the job market, they're ready to find their first engineering uh, position. So it would be great if you're here and if you know of any open positions in any area, engineering area, uh, you let them know. We really, really, really like to keep them around here. Keep them in some more county. So we don't want them to go to South Bay. We don't want them to get jobs in other uh, other states. So that's why it's really important for us that they can find a job here and stay here. Because then we can actually get your fair help as well. So that's for a very selfish reason. <laughs> um, so I believe everyone has a copy of the program. Uh, we will continue the presentations until 11 o'clock. From 11 to 11.30 there's a break. So you can actually see all the demos and talk to the students. 11.30 uh, we resume the program and we have, I think we should be done by 1 o'clock. And again, I want to thank everyone for being here. Thank you so much. And um, just as a reminder, I'm supposed to tell everyone a couple of things. If you happen to leave, if you want, if you need to leave early, please avoid walking through the middle aisle. And if you don't do that, they're going to get you to sign a form because your picture may appear in the film, so they can't have the permission. Um, in addition to that, each presentation is limited to 15 minutes. Um, all the presenters will be notified five minutes and one minute, so please pay attention to that. After 15 minutes, unfortunately, we have to cut you off, so you have to make sure that you can leave your presentation in 15 minutes. Each presentation followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. Um, we unfortunately have to go on, uh, so after 10 minutes, we definitely want to make sure that the next presenter comes and uh, start the presentation. So with that, uh, without any further ado, let's start with the first presentation. Thank you. Yes, 
Okay. So here's a little overview of what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to start off with what the problem is. So our main problem is speed. I know all of you have experienced this. I do it, you do it. And the leading <laughs> cause of accidents is actually due to speeding. Um, speeding is really dangerous. It causes your reaction time to be a lot slower. You're not only endangering yourself, but you're endangering everyone around you, the other cars, and also pedestrians who are either crossing the street or walking on the sidewalk as well. There's, office, there's also not enough police officers to roam the city to catch everyone who's speeding. So there's been some projects done to try and help with speeding. So as you know, we have speed limit signs that displays your speed, but I'm sure you all know these don't really work. And sometimes you're aware that you're speeding, but you just don't care. And, or you don't know if it's you who's speeding or the car who's next to you as well. And there's also speed bumps that are in residential areas, and this still hasn't been stopping people. And police officers using radar and ticketing. We interviewed a couple police officers and they say the problem with this is that there's not enough police officers to catch everyone. So that is why they've created these other things to try and help, but it's still not helping the problem. So wouldn't it be cool if we could think of something that could make people aware of what they're doing and stop them from speeding? So imagine this, you're driving down the street and you don't only see your speed sign flashing at you, but you also see your plate display, not just for you, but for everyone around you. Would that get your attention? I know it would get mine. So here's our um, project proposal. This is our system overview. So we have a 12 volt power supply, and that powers our Decatur radar, and then we have a 5 volt step down converter. That powers our Raspberry Pi. And then connected to our Raspberry Pi USB, we have our radar, our LCD display, and our high resolution Nikon camera. On our Raspberry Pi, we actually have a Python script running and calling everything. And we also have ALPR, which stands for Automated License Plate Recognition. And that is what can tell what your license plate number is. And that's also stored in the library on the Raspberry Pi. So ALPR, like I said before, stands for Automated License Plate Recognition. This is a technology that uses optical character recognition to recognize the characters on your license plate. First, it finds the plate's edges by the top, bottom, left, and right, and then it'll segment the characters on the plate. This isolates each individual character and will run the optical character recognition and analyze each character independently, and that's how we get the license plate number as a whole. So our three main marketing requirements are that it'll only detect the oncoming traffic, the second is that it won't display a false license plate number, and our third is that our module should have its own power supply since it's going to be outdoors. And then our three main engineering requirements that go along with those marketing requirements is that the radar we should select is that it should be configured so that it can be unidirectional. The second is that our ALPR algorithm will at least be 90% confident, and our third is that our system should run off a 12 volt battery and a 5 volt step down converter. So we had many challenges in our project, starting with our radar. We needed to make sure it had enough distance range and speed range for what we needed it to do. We needed a camera with a high enough shutter speed and resolution so that we don't get blurry pictures. We needed enough processing power that our ALPR algorithm can work in a timely manner before the car passes. We needed the system power if we needed it to last a long time. And our display needed to be visible enough for the driver to see as they're passing by. So our system first starts off with the radar. When choosing a radar, there was a few things we needed to make sure that the radar we chose had. We needed to make sure that it could be configured to only select unidirectional so that we can only get the oncoming traffic. The next thing was that we needed to make sure that it had enough distance range to pick up those cars that are speeding. And the third was to make sure that we could set the min and max speed that we wanted. This specific radar is designed for the speed limit sign, which is perfect for our project. And also, since we were testing in a 50 mile per hour zone, these went as low as 2 miles per hour. And here's how we configured our radar. So our radar is um, powered by a 12 volt battery source. And the radar itself, the radar itself has an RS-232 connection. To connect it to our Raspberry Pi, we needed a USB adapter. And once we had it all connected, we had to set up our Raspberry Pi so that it could select um, the serial ports, so that it could read the serial data. And we wrote the Python script so that if it was going five over the speed limit, it would then feed that data into the rest of our algorithm. <coughs> so the picture on the left 
left is our Raspberry Pi camera that we originally started with. We started with this because it was very cost efficient. Unfortunately, the shutter speed on this camera wasn't fast enough and all our pictures were too blurry to run our ALPR algorithm on. So we then moved on to this high resolution Nikon camera. It has a fast shutter speed, high resolution, and zoom capabilities. And all our pictures ended up turning out perfect. We originally started with MATLAB on our project for the character recognition. And I actually spent about three months at the beginning trying to get the MATLAB to work. Um, I sat down with a few professors and other people who are comfortable with MATLAB, and everyone kept telling me there's this library that I can just download of all the license plates, and I couldn't find that library, and it turns out it's actually illegal to store that library. So I was told that I would need to take a thousand pictures of different license plates and train the model myself. So after starting to take the pictures and getting really frustrated, I realized there has to be a better solution for this. It shouldn't be this challenging. And that's when I did some research and I found OpenALPR. It's an open source library, so anyone has access to it. And it's also free. So after about two hours of downloading, playing with it, testing it out, um, I was completely stress-free and it worked perfectly for what we needed it to do for our project. So when we first got the ALPR to work, this was our first test that we did to prove that it's working. So we just took a picture of a parked car, and as you can see, when we run the ALPR, it, the license plate is perfect. Our next test was an accuracy of our system working as a whole. So we did parked cars versus moving cars. So the first graph is our parked car. So we took 100 um, pictures of our parked cars, and when putting it through our algorithm, it was 86% accurate. That means the other 14%, either we couldn't detect a license plate, or if our confidence level wasn't 90% sure that our license plate was correct, we do not display anything at all. So our second test was on moving cars, and that was 74% accurate. And like I said before, so the other 26% means either we could not detect a license plate, or it wasn't 90% confident that it was right, and we do not display anything if that's the case. Our next test is our average time of our system as a whole. So we first started with testing the radar and the camera. On average, that takes about 6.97 seconds. And then we went to our algorith algorithm, since this is one of the most important parts, and that takes 8.34 seconds. So as you can see, for one process, that's a very long time. And so our whole system takes about 17 seconds from when we first detect the car's speed to when it displays the license. So this is our, we started with an LED matrix on the left, and in the lab it worked perfectly. We had two LEDs chained together, and we went to go test outside, and we accidentally gave a little bit too much voltage to it, and we blew out one of our chips, unfortunately, two days before our presentation, and we did not have any spare parts, and when looking to buy a new LED matrix, it wouldn't get here in time. So we had to think of an alternative, and that's when we decided to set up an LCD display. So the one on the right in our slow down license plate sign, it's very small, but that was just for demo purposes. So we wanted to put the picture in the middle to show you that is a computer screen. You can put it on any size you want. It doesn't even matter if it's small or large, and you can do LED matrix, LCD displays. This system can work with any kind of display. Another test result we did was in what kind of mile per hour zone, where the system needs to start in order for the driver to see it at the end. So we tested in a 15 mile per hour zone, meaning the car travels at 22 feet per second. So since our system takes about 17 seconds, that would mean our system would need to start at 374 feet away from the final display. And that's not even accounting for the reaction time the driver needs to realize that that's their license plate. So we decided to add about five seconds of reaction time, and that adds another 110 feet. So that leaves our system needing to start at 484 feet away for the final destination of the license plate. And as you can tell, that is a very far distance. So something we want to work on in the future is getting our whole algorithm to speed up as a whole in order to take down some of the distance for our project. So the next test we did, we wanted to see how long uh, our system would run. So we measured the current that the Raspberry Pi was drawing while running this algorithm, and it drew about 0.4 amps, and our radar drew about 0.7. So with those two components, our system will run for about a day and six hours. 
So for our camera, unfortunately, it wasn't able to hook up to an external power source. So that is a drawback for this module, but we're going to talk about what we would do in our future work. So like Courtney mentioned, our ALPR algorithm takes the longest amount of time. So for future work, we would suggest looking into a faster processor. We did some research in the NVIDIA board, and that does this ALPR algorithm a lot faster. However, it was not in our budget for this, pro for this project to buy such a board. Another thing we would suggest, since we are doing a lot of data transfer, was to figure out how we can do that a lot faster. And then also, we are using open ALPR, but the average time for that is about eight seconds on a Raspberry Pi. So possibly looking into different character recognition algorithms so that we can cut that time in half and make our system go a little bit faster. Um, like I mentioned before, our system's only running for about a day, and we would like to improve this project by implementing solar power to it so that it can um, elongate the lifetime. And same with um, getting a camera that's capable with hooking up to an external power. And for this project, it cost us $500 for our parts, and Decatur Radar was generous enough to donate the radar towards this project. Um, here is our schedule, or I should say proposed schedule. As everyone knows, things don't go according to plan, and something we wish we knew when planning the schedule was to give us double or at least triple the time we planned because things didn't go as they were planned and that did push us back. So when planning this, we would suggest to give yourself a little more time than you account for. Also, um, like Courtney mentioned, things do blow up. It's engineering, so to always order extra parts. So, so sorry. some supporting courses that helped us on our project was Python programming. Our whole script is actually Python. And then networking, because that's where we learned how to use a Raspberry Pi and what it's capable of doing. And then we have some other supporting courses. And then this is a list of the references we used when researching this project. And a lot of these resources helped us get us along the way of how we should go about going um, with this project. We would like to give a special thanks to Decatur Radar for donating the radar to us. Um, also, Pocket Radar for proposing this idea to us. Source funding for the $1,000 we were funded. Chris Stewart and Dr. Brennan Bissell for being our advisors on this project. And before we conclude, we'd like to invite you to our table to see how our system works on a moving vehicle. And we'd like to open the floor to any questions or comments. What's the uh, pixel density requirement to display? And I didn't see it in fact in your engineering requirement. In order to display the thing, you need to have certain, you know, I mean, have, have a good resolution for the display, right? Yeah. So um, we didn't calculate or look into the resolution on the LCD display because it was very clear regardless of how big we made it or vice versa. Um, right. The LED matrix was a 16 by 32 LED matrix, right. and we had two connected. And then um, for brightness on the LED display, I don't have the exact um, calculation, but we did order the specialized uh, P10 outdoor boards in the color green so that it could be seen outdoors. In one of the slides talking about the radar, it says 1,500 next to it. Is that 1,500 feet or? Yeah. Okay. Did, did you figure out the detection time for the <coughs> radar as part of your budget, your time budget? Sorry. So did you figure out the detection time? How long does it take for the radar to detect a moving object and report it over the RS-232? Um, we, we only calculated that with our camera as well. So the total time for the radar and the camera was about six seconds, but the camera took most of that time. So the radar was very fast. What would you recommend to the juniors next year? Um, we do a lot of research, um, and when we plan something out, also to think of alternative ways in case that doesn't work out and always have a backup plan just so you can get started. Um, and minimize the time in between if something does happen. And work on it over winter break. <laughs> <laughs> they tell you, but you don't, so.
And the, the radar we're using is specifically for the speed limit signs. We both wear glasses, so that's us. Test this out. I don't think it's working. I don't think it's Sweet. What do you want to say? What do you want to say? That's really good. Pretend you didn't see all this. Yeah, close your eyes, everyone. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. My name is Kui Rujan, and this is Michael Vargas, and we are the Drone Busters. All right, so here's a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to go ahead and jump right into the problem. Sorry. Oh, wrong way. It's okay. We're good. <laughs> all right, so with an emerging drone market, legislation has had trouble keeping up with this emerging technology. Most recently, with the Northern California fires, Cal Fire was unable to utilize air support to fight the fires with fire retardant and or water because of the fear for mid-air collisions with people using their drones to fly and take pictures or videos. Another problem that's been emerging is people flying too close to airports. Now, this causes a problem when people are trying to take pictures or videos of landing planes. Last year alone, there were nearly 60 mid-air collisions with landing planes. And lastly, People are using drones to drop drugs and contraband into prison yards. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's real. real All right, so now I want to mention some existing work. There's three companies currently, Tech Inc., Drone Detection, and Drone Shield. The three things that these companies do, and the one thing that they have in common, is that they only detect the presence of the drone. And that's where we're different. So our solution is a focus on locating the drone's pilot. This will allow our user to bring the drone down in a quick and timely manner. So our customer are those who lease airspace, such as airports, emergency responders, and prisons. The goal of our project is to direct our user to the location of the drone pilot. The pain that we avoid is the pain of mid-air collisions, a delay in emergency response time by first responders, and contraband in our prison yards. The gain from our product is a reduction in the amount of time it takes to locate and safely bring down the drone. All right, so we're gonna go over our product requirements now. And one thing I wanna stress is that our marketing requirements drove our engineering requirements and then we proved those with tests and results. So let's start off with some of the marketing requirements. The device must have the ability to detect the Propel Mini drone. That's the drone we purchase. So we characterize the drone and we need to make sure we can detect that. Another one, the device must be able to detect the pilot within half the max operating range of our drone. The device must have a method for determining and displaying to the user which direction they need to move. And lastly, we must be able to update the user in a quick enough time so they can respond to the changing direction of the pilot. Here's a quick system overview of our device. So we have an antenna to receive the signal. It's in, pushed into an SDR or software defined radio. Then that goes into a Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi then does some computation and that notifies the user with our displays. And this is all powered via DC battery drive. Here is a high level overview of the front end of our receiver. It consists of an antenna, 
feeding into a mixer with various stages of filtering and amplification. I'd like to direct your attention to the three stages of amplification. We have RF gain, IF gain, and baseband gain. These three gains are adjustable in our settings, and they each increase the power of our detected drone signal. However, each one also uniquely contributes to an increase in the noise floor of our system. We'll touch on this on a later slide. All right, so this is one of our first tests, and arguably the most important. This is where we characterize the remote control of our drone. So on the right, on the left-hand side <laughs> is the frequency domain. So as you can see, our remote control transmits at four different frequencies in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. Now, on the right-hand side, we have the time domain. So what our remote control does is it looks at one, it starts at one frequency, transmits for around a millisecond, switches to the next frequency, the next frequency, and then the next frequency. All four signals are transmitted within four milliseconds. This is followed by a four millisecond period of no signals being transmitted, and then this repeats which gives us a period of eight milliseconds. Now, because our SDR only has a, a bandwidth of 20 megahertz at which we can look at the spectrum, we had to focus in on one of the channels. We also only have a 60 dB of dynamic range, and this image right here shows what our SDR looked like when we were targeted at that same frequency, looking at the same channel. Now, the reason the 20 megahertz is important is we need to be able to capture the noise floor as well as the peak of the signal. Without this, there's no way to capture a signal to noise ratio, or SNR. Here is a high-level overview of our Python algorithm code. First step we took was we wanted to ensure that we detected our drone signal, so we took multiple samples. Next, we applied filtering to eliminate other sim uh, signals that we detected within the same frequency range that did not match the characteristics of our drone signal. Lastly, we applied some averaging. This gave us a stable reading and um, allowed our user to accurately locate the direction of the drum pilot. Here are the results of our first field test. For the first field test, we utilized the 10 megahertz bandwidth window when looking at the spectrum. We also are using an omnidirectional antenna. Now, it was a requirement that we detect our drone within half the operational distance that our drone can, uh, can operate. So for our smaller power drone, the half operational distance was 75 feet. We needed to, we needed to attain a 3 dB signal to noise ratio at this 75 foot mark. And right off the bat, our first test, we achieved 5 dB. These are the results of our second field test. This time around, like Michael pointed out previously, we increased the bandwidth window to 20 megahertz. This allowed us to capture a better signal to noise ratio. Secondly, we were using a directional antenna for this test. As you can see, our half drone range length of 75 feet, we were now detecting 11 dB. This is 1 dB less than the Agilent box with the omnidirectional antenna. Our 3 dB cutoff signal to noise ratio was achieved at a distance of 105 feet to the pilot of the drone. All right, so we keep talking about the signal to noise ratio. But I want to do a little bit more explanation on how that contributed, especially when we're talking about the three gain stages. So earlier we mentioned the RF gain, the IF gain, and the base gain gain. Now, depending on how we adjusted those different variables, <coughs> we introduced more noise into our system. Because the noise of the system will dominate, we wanted to make sure to optimize it for our, what we needed to do, which was detect the pilot of the drone at least 75 feet away. So we made sure to adjust those variables to give us the best signal to noise ratio. Oh, so some challenges we went over. Uh, we needed to find the correct antenna while balancing beam width against the antenna size. Uh, there, there's different things we, can, we could have used, and we'll get into that a little bit later, as well as response time of the user display. So if we weren't able to update our user in a, in a rapid enough time, then they could be going the wrong direction and the pilot could be moving in another. Uh, we also needed to balance the number of FFT points we selected. Uh, we'll touch on how that messes with resolution and dynamic range in the later slide. And then lastly, dealing with interfer interfering signals in the 2.4 gigahertz uh, ISM band. You know, there's Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, et cetera. Our drone also operates in that band. All right, so characterization of the antennas. We chose to use a Yagi antenna because of the fact that they provide directionality. Now, on the right hand, oh, here we go again. On the left hand side, 
we, uh, what we did is we put our antenna on a turntable, which was then pointed towards uh, calibrated antenna, which went into a spectrum analyzer. We moved in two degree increments and measured the signal strength. From there, we achieved that, that polar plot you see there. And at the half power mark, our antenna was characterized to have a 30 degree beam length. Now what that means is if uh, somebody raise your hand in the back, boom. If I'm pointing this way and he's operating the drone, I'm gonna detect that signal better than if I'm pointing this way. That's due to the fact that the antenna is directional. On the right hand side, we have a dish antenna. Now the beam width of a dish antenna might provide better accuracy in terms of locating the pilot, but it was very large and bulky. To get better beam width, you need a larger antenna. So I think the dish we purchased ended up being rather large and, and that, that, that didn't work for us. So we ended up sticking with the ID. Like Michael said, one of our challenges was the response time of our system. So two things influenced the response time. The size of our Python algorithm, as well as the size of our Fourier transform. The benefit of having a larger Fourier transform is that you get a better re resolution of the signal that you're viewing, as well as a lower noise floor. However, the higher the Fourier transform, the slower the computation of our system. As you can see on the left, we have a graph of the Fourier transform size versus the time it took from one iteration of our algorithm to run. We found a good trade-off point at a Fourier transform size of 512. It was also a requirement that we update our user within five seconds of to the direction of the drone pilot. Like Michael said previously, our Yagi has a 30 degree beam. That means that we have 12 sections that make up a complete rotation. In order to achieve five second update time, we need to update our user within 400 milliseconds within each window. After our test, we concluded that we updated our user within 250 milliseconds, so that was almost half the time um, required. Another challenge we faced was interfering signals in the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band that our drone operated in. The biggest interference that we had to deal with was Wi-Fi interference. On the left, you can see a picture in the frequency domain of two Wi-Fi signals. On the right, we turned on our drone remote, and it is important to note that our drone remote was a lot closer to the antenna than the Wi-Fi router was. So in a real environment, the Wi-Fi actually um, drowns out our drone signal in a higher amplitude. Um, as you can see, the two drone signals block three of our four frequency shift keying channels. And this was a problem for us. So we were able to develop an algorithm which could look through the Wi-Fi interference and detect our drone signal's presence. The benefit of this is that it increased our customer base as well as increased um, urban environments in which we could use our device. So here's the final implementation. Like I said, as we've mentioned, we have an antenna, which goes into our radio receiver, or our software-defined radio in this case. That goes to our single board computer, which is the Raspberry Pi 3. Now that does all the computation and analysis of the data after the SDR has performed the Fourier transform. This then updates the user with two LED arrays. We have a real-time array and then one with more persistence slash uses our algorithm to figure out if it's the drone. This is all powered by the battery pack. And on the right-hand side, that's the final product. We invite you to our booth to uh, come check it out and see how it works. Here is the budget it took to develop our device. Originally, we had an LCD, $100 LCD touchscreen display that was going to be a part of our final product. We did use this LCD screen for field testing to make adjustments to our algorithm. However, in the end, we determined that our LED arrays were efficient enough to direct our user to the location of the drone pilot. Therefore, we got rid of the LCD to save battery consumption. Secondly, we have a $20 Yagi antenna. Now, if we were to do this all over again, we would invest more money in um, and then more expensive and better quality Yagi antenna. The Yagi that we used um, had a 30 degree beam width, which gave us the directionality we needed. However, it did not cover um, a large range, didn't offer much DVI gain to our system. So our total came to $465. This is well below the $600 that source funding granted us. 
This was only possible because our software-defined radio, the Hack RF1, was donated to us at no cost. So some future work, some things that we didn't have time to implement, but we would have liked to. We would have liked testing with different antenna arrays. For example, TDOA, or time difference of arrival. We would have liked to maybe try some pseudo-Doppler arrays uh, to see if that would make an easier use case for our users to find the pilot of the drone. Another thing would be to generate a library to expand our device capability. Because we only had one drone to characterize, we could only find the pilot of our drone. So much like a universal remote works for many different models of TV, we want to encompass a library of characterizations of different types of drones so we can find the pilot of any drone. And then lastly, we'd like to reduce the size of our device. Once you guys get back there, you know, it's a little bulky. One thing we can quickly do to, limit the, uh, to reduce the size is choose a different battery pack. Our battery pack gives us a runtime of around 25 hours continuously, when realistically we probably only need four or five. Another thing, instead of using the SDR that we did, we use different, a better, we use a one SDR with multiple front ends to look at the 900 megahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, and 5.8 gigahertz spectrum. Those are the three frequencies that the drones operate in. And then lastly, lastly would be, oh yeah, instead of using a Raspberry Pi 3, we'd use a more dedicated microcontroller to do the processing and analysis. Here's some of our references. And then before we get to any questions, like I said before, I know there's a lot of engineers, especially some RF guys, so you guys can you know, hold back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to it. Who's gonna go first? That's a great question. So for a drone to operate at a distance of five miles, that means they have to transmit a stronger signal. Mm -hmm. So by transmitting a stronger signal and investing in a better Yagi antenna, uh, we feel like we'd be able to, to detect the pilot. Well, actually, another thing that comes in, the further you are away, you need a uh, better beam width, smaller beam width. Because as the distance increases, you know, it's gonna be, it'll encompass more area. Kind of like a flashlight. If you move away from a wall, the, the size increases. It's the same problem. So there would be definitely some challenges for that. Maybe you use multiple users of the same type of device and they're communicating and you can triangulate. Um, but yeah, that would definitely pose a problem. Don? What was the gain of your Yagi antenna? And if you were to have an unlimited budget for a mm -hmm. better antenna, how much better could you do? Well, the Yagi antenna, according to the website, there was no data sheet for it. The website specified 26 dBi of gain. Um, so we tested it and it came to about 4 dBi of gain, but we have a long transmission cable, which it was pretty much all lost in. So it came to zero. And I want to emphasize another thing you know, on that point is we were not in an anechoic chamber. So when we were trying to measure the gain, uh, you know, we, we can't account for multipath and things of that nature. So it's, we believe, well, we know our antenna was a piece of crap. So uh, it didn't really have any game, uh, but we can't, we, I don't want to give an exact number. We just, yeah. it, wasn't a good, it wasn't a good intent. Okay, thank you. Yes. So you guys teased us a little bit in um, alluding to an algorithm that was able to detect your pilot's transmitter uh -huh. over the Wi-Fi noise. Can yeah. you give us just a little more? So you want some of our trade secrets here? I want <laughs> I, I, I'd like the uh, um, declassified version. <laughs> okay, so sure, yeah, and in a nutshell, um, our drone signal was very constant when we got the readings and calculated the SNR. There wasn't a huge variation in them, but the Wi-Fi um, sent out uh, kind of spikes in a sense. So we set a delta of four across all our readings, and if we surpassed that delta four then we knew it wasn't our drone signal, and it was Wi-Fi. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, if you come back to our booth, we'll happy to, we can elaborate a little bit. I'll come over. Right. <laughs> she got a hand up real quick. Uh, if um, you had a particular area to protect, say, an airport, mm -hmm. how might your design change to be stationary versus mobile? Well, so there's already companies that are doing that exact thing. So maybe we wouldn't look to impede on their market and what they have already. We'd be looking to add to it. So they already detect, you know, you can put a perimeter up and they'll detect the drone. We're saying we'll find the pilot. So. But we could also change our system to have kind of an array of antennas. Right. And we could use the, the Persuado Doppler. Pseudo Doppler. Pseudo Doppler. 
always get that word wrong. Sorry. And then we can, you don't even need to move the system, you can locate the direction. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, so the antenna actually wouldn't move. You went the pseudo Doppler, it's time multiplexing between the antennas and looking for the phase difference. And that's what can help guide the user to the platform. Yeah. Uh, who is your customer and what's the, the, the input so far, the feedback? So it was kind of hard for us to say a specific customer. I guess for the sake of the project, it would be TSAC because Dr. Lauren Betts was our client. Um, but I guess if we're looking to sell this, it would be uh, emergency responders like CAL FIRE. Uh, it would be possibly prisons looking to find people trying to drop contraband. And then uh, airports looking to find the pilot. I guess maybe law enforcement or emergency responders if I was going to give it a larger bubble. Because I think because pilots aren't being held accountable, there's being, there's a lot, there's, and as the drone market increases, we're going to see more instances and more problems arise. Uh, so, what's, what was the output of your SDR? What's the input your code? What's, say, one more time, I'm sorry? The output of your SDR? Yeah. And the input your code. Okay, so the, what was the last part? He's saying the output of the SDR yeah. and the input. Like, so what's going into the Raspberry Pi? Oh, okay, well, it comes in in the, time domain, um, yeah. the, the strength of the signals. Then we, we perform the Fourier transform inside the SDR, and then we feed that data into um, the Raspberry Pi. So for example, let's say we, we program the SDR using new radio, uh, and it'll give us, we chose a 512 point uh, FFT. So then that outputted an array of 512 points, which went into the Raspberry Pi, and then we did some analysis on that. We did further you know, data analysis. Basically, you get the spectrum. Exactly. Yes. Oh boy, I'm going to regret this. All right, then let me go this way. <laughs> so, uh, what's the Fourier transform of a rectangle function? Okay. So, the Fourier transform of a rect rectangle function would be a sync function? There we go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, you just keep that in mind. Yeah. Keep that in mind, Junior. Yeah, I hope call you on it. Can, can you, can you demodulate the FSK signal into like, meaningful? Information about the drone. I'll take it. Okay, so we could demodulate, possibly. We didn't go that approach because after doing further uh, research on drones, that was our uh, intern, Brandon Barron. I don't know where he's at, but thank you. He did some research on uh, how other drone companies do it, and a lot of them will use encryption. So we didn't want to demodulate and look for any type of identifier for that reason, because if it's encrypted, uh, you know, we can't do much with that. Uh, on the other hand, we can always uh, capture the signal in the time and frequency domain. So that's why we went that route. Okay, so I'm okay, next. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Uh, so it looked like it was a proprietary um, communication protocol that they were using all that drone, is that correct? Uh, FSK? I, yeah, I'm sure it's probably there. Yeah, well, I mean, on top of like, like it's, it's not VLE, it's not Wi Fi. Right, right, yeah. So, so did you look at the um, other drones in the uh, frequency domain and see if they're similar protocols? No, we didn't. I'm going to be honest, we didn't. Um, for our proof of concept, we focused on one drone, mm -hmm. but we're going to have a library and characterize um, every different type of drone. We would have liked to, uh, to be honest. It, we didn't have really money to buy multiple drones. Our source funding was kind of limited. We maybe could have, but uh, we probably would have been tempted to do some creeping featureism. So mm -hmm. we kind of just to keep back. That's phase two. Yeah, that's phase three. <laughs> I know where you work, so I'll show you once I get there. Uh, okay, yes. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, it was you, it was you, it was your turn. Okay. To start with, it's a, it's a nice part of the project. Uh, but I have a comment and a question. Mm -hmm. uh, the measurement that you did for the antenna, the activity, you said it's DBI, right? What is I there? D DBI, DBI is isotropic gain. Yes, it's DB over isotropic. Okay. Okay? So, when you did the measurement, actually, you cannot do it accurately unless you have an isotropic measurement or isotropic antenna uh -huh. to compare with. So this is what we did, actually. Okay. Uh, we're in the office, though, and we, did, we were not in an anechoic chamber, but this is how we did it. We first put a calibrated antenna okay. at a certain height and distance, and we radiated the field. Then we switched out that antenna out, and we grabbed our measurements you know, from the calibrated antenna. We switched out that antenna, put in our Yagi antenna, and repeated the same measurement. What isotropic antenna did you use? We used a 2.4 gigahertz uh, antenna that was just, it was, a, it was a monopole antenna. What? A monopole. So it was a... Monopole is not isotropic. Oh, okay. You need, you well, you're saying in all you dimensions. Need, yeah. You need a point source. Okay. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that you have uniform... Direct. Direct radiation. Okay. One thing. The other thing is, 
the Yagi antenna mm -hmm. is very much frequency dependent, mm -hmm. just like all antennas, yeah. especially Yagi. Right. Okay, and I don't know if you looked at the operation frequency of that Yagi that you used, because typically the commercial Yagi available is for TV use, UHF, VHF. This, this one though is 2.4 to 2.5. We put it on the network analyzer and looked at the S11 over turn loss. To look because at return loss to, to see how well it's matched? The activity and the efficiency of radiation. Okay. Okay? Yeah. So that's something to, you know. Yeah, yeah, we'll keep that in mind. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you mentioned earlier in your talk that uh, uh, part of the intention of the project is to detect the drone and then bring it down. Right. How do you bring it down? You get a nice police officer with a gun, and he okay. finds the pilot, and then he tells him to bring the drone down. <laughs> <laughs> time for one more question. Okay. Wait, uh, I think, wait, did you already go though? You already got a question. I already had one, but okay. How did you, um, did you do any actual field testing? Yes, like went out to a field and actually did a test. That's what, that's what our field tests were. Did you have any Wi-Fi interferers out on that field? Yeah, actually we would experience, I don't know if we'd say, well, so we went to parks. Okay. And then at the parks there was houses surrounding it. So yeah, that was initially so, a problem. So, so just describe how you judged success in this Field trial. I'm just, I'm just curious what you actually did. Yes. So we had a it sounds like fun. <laughs> oh no, it was a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, but yeah. a lot of fun. We had the the wheel as you walk with it. It tells you the distance you covered. Sure. So we would walk to different distances. Yeah. We have our system set up with an LCD, and we're printing the SNR value. Yep. And then that way we're able to record the SNR at various distances. Now, what what showed what proved our success is as it was printing out. We also had our two antenna arrays. So we would see if our algorithm, the antenna array that used our algorithm and persistence, would also light up at certain distances. <coughs> so once we got to a dis distance of 105 feet, we were able to light up our array that indicated we thought it was the drone. And that's two LED arrays. Now, is this with you rotating as no. well? Well, you, you have to do, yes, you have to yeah, move. You, you do have to rotate, rotate to find it. Did, um, you, did you know where your uh, pilot was? No, so actually, here's a funny thing. Uh, and you can, I swear to you, you can ask, some of my bosses are in the audience. What we did is we would hide the remote control in the office with Wi-Fi present, and we'd hand it to one of them. And we'd say, go find the remote control. Right. And then that's, they would find it. That's, that's a good test. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> that's that it.
here's an overview of uh, how we'll present our presentation. We'll start with the problem and solution, then we'll go over the general system overview and the system description and technical components. Uh, we'll list our critical marketing engineering requirements. We'll go over our test results, uh, the materials and costs. Uh, we'll show our timeline. We'll talk about the challenges we face, the lessons we learned, some future works and consideration. And we'll conclude with questions in the end. So every year, millions of people are diagnosed with diabetes throughout the world. And this can lead to a disease that's called diabetic retinopathy, which is a disease of the eye, which can lead to blindness or distorted vision. So <clears throat> a big issue that we saw in our project was a lack of awareness for the actual disease and what it can do to those who are diagnosed with it. So there has been previous works in creating a solution for this problem. One has been done by a social enterprise called Peak Vision. Uh, what they've done was uh, create a software application on our smartphones that could be used to uh, scan a, to take a picture of a patient's retina. Um, but the major setback with theirs is that it doesn't use, use machine learning and their processing speed is rather long or slow. Another one has been done by Epipol, which is an engineering-led British company. And what they created was a handheld retinal fundus camera that also uh, uh, scans for uh, retinal fundus images among patients. But their major setback is that um, it requires specific operating systems to work on, and it requires an uh, internet uh, uh, connection. So our solution is that we want to create our own standalone diagnostic tool that will give us an instant result by utilizing machine learning and image processing. And we also want it to be uh, internet dependent. And this uh, diagnostic tool should be given, is uh, results from the device should be taken to a licensed medical professional. Uh, so here's a picture of uh, what our final product looks like. So as you can see, um, our computer that contains the, the MATLAB software application is connected to the Raspberry Pi through a crossover Ethernet cable. And the Raspberry Pi is connected uh, to the LED box through uh, jumper wires. And the Raspberry Pi is powered by an anchor battery pack. And a Raspberry, uh, sorry, a camera called the ArduCam is uh, connected through uh, one of the Raspberry Pi ports in order to take uh, photos. I don't know about you, but I thought of that song, you know, with the bones. Like which bones connect to which bone? Anyway, so <clears throat> we're going to give you a general system overview of what our device does. So we look at a retina image. We take an image with our camera. So you're not taking an image of someone's actual retina, but of a picture of that uh, retina. And it goes through our machine learning algorithm. And then our result is displayed in MATLAB and with our health indicator, which is an LED. And yeah, that is what our device does. So here we have a visual representation about our hardware design model. So as you can see, uh, it shows how all, all, all of our components are connected together and how they interact with each other. The Raspberry Pi is the central unit of the system because it's the one, it's the main component that connects all the other components together. And, and yeah. So this is a very basic overview of how our program actually works. So first, we go through and initialize our algorithm, and then we take our image and we ask, does it have diabetic retinopathy? If it does, it turns on our, our LED, and it will say diabetic retinopathy in MATLAB. If not, it will say healthy, and our LED will remain off. And then it will store the data, and then we'll start this program over again. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> so I'd like to go through some of our key marketing requirements that we needed to match for our project. So, this device must be reliable in determining the health state of a person. So, of a picture of a patient's retina. The device will capture uh, the images with high resolution and it will, be fully, it will not be fully automated but will be easy for consumers to use. And finally, one of our very key marketing requirements is that it will be marketed toward physicians and medical professionals throughout the world that do not have access to this technology. 
And then the right, we have our critical engineering requirements. Uh, one of them is that the accuracy rate of the product must be over 90%, because otherwise it's not a reliable device. Um, the device will contain four components, then being the Raspberry Pi, the camera called the ArguCam, the battery pack, and the LED box light. Uh, the project does require using computer, uh, using MATLAB to interface with the device, but uh, just, uh, the user will only need to use a, a few minimal commands in order to uh, execute the device. And most importantly, this, the functionality of this device will be a precursor into taking a scan of a, into, into taking an actual scan of a patient's uh, retina, which is a practice done by licensed individuals. So, when we're dealing with this project, a big question was, what is machine learning? So, it's a type of computer programming that uses data in order to make itself smarter and to train itself. So, I wanted to go into some of the steps on how that works. So, initially, it trains the data, it extracts some features, and then it basically teaches itself, learns some models, and then you take an input image in our case, you look at those features, you classify or model it, and then you get your result. So we'll go more into this about our own project and how that works. And then a key thing that we had to use throughout our project was the confusion matrix, was basically a way to classify our algorithm and to make sure that it was running properly. Okay, so <clears throat> in order to actually check between healthy retinas and, um, and retinas with diabetic retinopathy, we looked for, <clears throat> our algorithm looked for dark spots, blood vessel issues, and uh, uh, eye shape issues, so damage to your eyes. <clears throat> and in our first test that we did, we, this is our big one, so we tested 21 different types of classifiers in order to basically check to see which one would give us the highest average accuracy. Initially, we found that we had eight that did this at a high accuracy of eight, of 60%, and then we went farther into our testing, and from this, we kept looking at the different confusion matrices, and came to the conclusion that the linear support vector machine classifier would be the best one for our project. <clears throat> and so, our big issue when we started this was that our average accuracy was only 60%, so we had to increase it up to 90%, uh, so big 30% 30, 30 difference. So we initially did this, or started this process, by deleting our third group, which we'll talk more about this uh, in a little bit. And we increased the number of actual images in our diabetic retinopathy group, which actually increased our, oh, our average accuracy up to 91.7%. And we found that our false discovery rate, meaning us telling someone that they're healthy rather than saying, oh, you actually have diabetic retinopathy, was at 2% and was 22% for healthy retinas. <clears throat> and so we wanted to test our algorithm so we can't just say, oh, it works. Um, so we took 60 images, 30 with diabetic retinopathy and 30 that were healthy, that were not included in our testing algorithm. And we were able to conclude that we only had one image misplaced for diabetic retinopathy. So that gave us a 3% false accuracy rate. And then we had five misplaced for healthy, which gave us a 17% false accuracy rating. So overall, we had our average accuracy up to 90%, which was our goal for the project. So in terms of automation, so for all of you who are not sure of how this thing works. What it does is um, you put a picture of a retina on this image in front of the camera. The camera takes a picture of that retina picture. It saves that picture into the directory of where the algorithm is currently at. And then it uses the classifier to check for the features of that retina on this image. And then it tells the user, like, hey, this image has uh, features of diabetic retinopathy. It, it, it is a retinal, retinal fungus image with diabetic retinopathy. If it doesn't, it says health. And uh, this program works like a single click of a mouse. So it satisfies one of our engineering requirements for its simplicity. 
So, like we mentioned before, we added an LED box light, and basically what it does is that um, when the output of the algorithm says uh, diabetic retinopathy, the light will blink uh, on. If it says healthy, the light will blink uh, zero. So it really works just as a health indicator for the user to know. So here we have, uh, we boxed uh, all the materials that we use in our project and their costs. If you can look closely, the most uh, biggest cost was the MATLAB Student Edition because the, um, that was our main uh, software application and it contained all the necessary uh, toolboxes related to uh, machine learning and image processing. Some other major costs was the Ethernet adapter and the Raspberry Pi model. Uh, we were fortunate to have our industry advisor to give us a spare model in case, uh, as a backup, in case something went wrong. Luckily, uh, everything went smoothly. And we'd like to thank Source for giving us $400, $400 uh, in, leading our, in helping complete our project, which was more than enough. Oh, and we'd like to thank uh, Sean for uh, donating parts. Um, I don't know where he is, but, but oh, there you are. Uh, but thanks uh, for uh, providing us the stuff we need and for helping us out. And so this is a timeline of how we completed our project. Um, the first part was basically working on the aspect, I mean the software aspect, and then it was working on the hardware aspect. And then while doing so, we kept up with the documentation and updating the website. Um, we came some, through some issues such as testing, debugging, and communication, which led to some drawbacks and time constraints. Getting MATLAB to communicate with the Raspberry Pi caused a major delay, but in the end, we were able to get a fully functional and working project, and that's all that matters. So some challenges we had to face was that we originally wanted to use a, the NVIDIA, an NVIDIA embedded platform, which was much stronger than the Raspberry Pi, but we didn't have enough outside support in getting us, in getting help to use it for our project, so we, uh, we relied on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, we had little experience in using machine learning and image processing in applying to projects, but luckily that was a major hurdle we were able to uh, overcome. Uh, like I mentioned before, getting MATLAB on the Raspberry Pi, it seemed like an easy process, but the only way you can really do that is uh, through a computer, through support packages, and like just interface it from the computer to the Raspberry Pi. MATLAB on the Pi, that's not possible. And then, of course, testing and updating our algorithm to 90%, to have a 90% accuracy rate was another one, because we also needed, a, we want the device to be highly reliable. So some things that we learned throughout this project is that progress isn't a straight path, especially when you're doing a software-based project, and that things go wrong. And by things, we mean everything, generally all at once. And that teamwork and dedication are vital when taking on a new project. So in the next phase of our project, we would basically like to add a retinal fundus camera and get the help of a licensed medical professional in order to make our device able to be used on the human retinas. And so we'd like to take a moment to uh, thank our professor, Fareed Fairmont, our faculty advisor, Dr. Shadir Shrestha, industry advisor, Ben Baldovinos, and our client, North Bay Vision Center. Without their support, we would not have been able to get this project up and going. And then we'd also like to thank our family and friends for their support throughout this project. And these are some of the references that we use. And then now we have time to open for questions and comments. Yeah, uh, can you share, share with us uh, the feedback of your uh, of your customer, which is in, who is in fact what uh, the uh, North Bay Vision Center. So, like, what 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 did what they say? Yeah. Oh, um, so um, when I uh, presented them about like creating this uh, device, uh, they thought it was like uh, they thought it was like something that should be like done because this this device is like for something for like uh, health practitioners in rural regions with limited access limited access to healthcare. People that have limited access to healthcare can use, or yeah, can use. Um, they said that even though, um, even, though if we, even if we have a 9% accuracy rate, they, 
they said that we sh they should um, we should still have a or health practitioners should still have like doctors that can like take a look at the inspection or the picture that was taken and actually like fully state whether um, those retinal images have a, uh, are correct because they did say that even if uh, even if the testing even if a device is highly reliable there's bound to uh, they're bound to make some errors they're not fully really perfect and also that what are the identifiers that you use to train the uh, the, the, the algorithm? Yeah. So I took basically 45 different images of uh, retinas with diabetic retinopathy, and the algorithm basically looked for uh, different dark spots, uh, blood vessels, uh, a lot of key indicators that you'll see from the disease. So. There's even things like breakages in the actual eyeball. If you look really closely, you can see in the pictures that there are spots gone. Right. Like literally the eyes falling apart in front of you. Right. It's pretty interesting. Thank you. No one else? So your um, training set was 45 images? Uh, 45 for the diabetic uh, images and then 15 for healthy images, so 60 total. Was there any chance of having access to more images, like through NIST or through the North Bay Vision Center? Uh, yes. Um, I'm not sure if you could come from North Bay Vision Center, but we found all of our images online in uh, Retina and databases that were from medical professionals. Yes? Uh, do you expect your, your, the product to actually use MATLAB and on a standalone workstation? So you're going to like the user has to make MATLAB work in order to make the product work? Um, for right now, yes, but we would want to simplify our project down and not actually have to use MATLAB. So be able to use machine learning um, through another process. I'm not sure how to do it yet. <laughs> I want to take more time to actually do that, but for now, yes. So the, would the device itself be, be need, you would need to train it or repeatedly in order to get the machine learning algorithm to work, or is it you're putting something on the device that has been trained externally? Um, it's been trained already. So sometimes with the uh, training sets, if you train it on your data, you start to especially get an actual when you Did you ever test taking another sample, a new eye, and burning it that you didn't train against to see how that would correlate with your accuracy? Yes, actually. Um, we started off with only 15 images in each set. And so I added in more data. And I also did the thing where I uh, put uh, diabetic retinas in the wrong folder to see what it would do. Nice. Like living on the edge. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir. Do you have a feel for how available the alternative to this is? Like, how big is the market for a free for your solution? Can you uh, repeat your question because I can't hear you. Yeah, so um, how available is alternative technology to this? And like. How big of a need is uh, your technology, your solution? Uh, well, there's a, uh, there has been a, a couple of uh, works that have been made already about creating uh, portable devices. Um, what we want to do is like implement like the machine learning and image processing, so it can give like an instant result, not something that will wait like uh, I don't know, five to ten minutes. Um, and we also, although. For this project, it doesn't. It's not really portable, but we want to work towards getting an actual portable, compact portable device, so that you know health practitioners around the world can use it to treat patients or to like use use it to tell people that they have growing symptoms of the disease, and then they can go to a doctor and seek uh, treatment. Yes, sir. Um, can this technique be used for? Uh very early detection of diabetes, like that maybe it's not these images, but it's maybe a different image set that's in you know, pre-diabetic kind of conditions, or I, I don't know enough about the medicine, but is it possible you could have a home version that could warn you, you know, with some inexpensive future model of your, your headed toward diabetes, especially if you're not available to go get a blood test or go to a hospital? I'm sure it could be, but uh, it would probably depend on how variant your images are as well because it can have issues if your images are too close together to actually be able to tell the difference between them. Any 
Thank you. start the presentation off. Uh, so when we started this project, we knew that we wanted to focus on home brewing. Um, and after conducting some research, we discovered that there's an estimated 1.1 million home brewers nationwide that brewed an astounding 1.4 million barrels of beer in 2017 alone. Uh, after interviewing a number of these home brewers and conducting our own research, we discovered a few different problems that we wanted to tackle with our project. Uh, the first of which is that there's currently no inexpensive system on the market for home brewers to track and control the temperature of their beer throughout the brewing process. The second of which is that there's currently no uh, cost-effective way for home brewers to do their own quality control on their finished beer uh, after they finish beer, uh, brewing it. The typical home brewing process has five uh, phases to it. The first of which is cleaning and sterilizing of the equipment and the environment. The second of which is mashing. Uh, uh, third is your boiling phase. The fourth is your fermentation. And then finally, you have your maturing phase. We, however, will only be focusing on the mashing and boiling phase uh, because we believe this is where we can add the, uh, 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 the most uh, uh, value uh, in the ongoing process. And finally, we will be focusing on the end product. This is where we confirm the efficiency and consistency of each batch. Uh, so our solution to the problems that we just mentioned are that we wanted to develop a low-cost temperature control uh, module that would allow an average home brewer to track and control the temperature of the boil and mash processes. Um, and we also wanted to develop a low-cost uh, color detection system that would allow uh, home brewers to do their own quality control at home um, with uh, very little upkeep. And then finally, we wanted to develop a wirelessly, or we, make, we wanted to make the whole system wireless, uh, modular, and be expandable in the future. Um, so at the beginning of this project, we set forward uh, with a list of marketing and engineering requirements. Uh, the engineering requirements fulfill the marketing requirements and were made for them. Um, so for example, we wanted each module to be completely wireless, um, and we met this with the engineering requirement that we wanted to use XBs and have a range of at least 10 meters. Uh, our second marketing requirement I want to show you guys was that uh, we wanted to develop a um, system that would be able to accurately track and control the temperature of the mashing and boiling processes. We met this with the requirement that we would be able to measure between 0 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius and have an accuracy of 0 0.25 degrees Celsius. And then finally, we wanted the color detection system to operate using the standard reference method, uh, which we'll get into later in the presentation. Um, and we wanted to be able to measure between 2 and 20 SRM. Now, this is a high-level overview of our system. It starts with our temperature control module, moves on to our color detection module, and finally our base station. This is our final temperature control module. It consists of our 3D printed case, our printed circuit board, a thermocouple, and a solid state relay. This module allows a home brewer to improve the quality of their beer by brewing consistently. This is done in the mashing step. This is where a home brewer takes their starches, usually grains or malts, and brews them in hot water. Enzymes in beer, alpha amylase and beta amylase, break down these starches into simple sugars known as dextrins. These have a great impact on the final taste and color of the beer. To do this, our module follows a recipe-dependent temperature path automatically, 
and stays within a specific temperature range known as the brewer's window. This optimizes the activation of our enzymes to improve the quality of the beer by providing consistent temperature conditions. Now the basis of our automation is a proportional integral and derivative or PID algorithm. It's a control loop with a feedback mechanism that allows us to quickly reach a set point with very little overshoot. It's based on an error calculation, which is the difference between your set point and your current measured value. This allows us to ramp up to and stay at specific temperatures depending on the recipe of the beer that we're brewing. This is the hardware design of our module. It starts with our PIC microcontroller, which takes temperature readings using our thermocouple, transmits them through the XD wireless platform to the base station where the PID algorithm is performed. This sends command back to our microcontroller on whether or not to activate our relay, which turns on our heating element. This is our printed circuit board, or PCB. We designed them ourselves, and we had them manufactured, and we implemented them in our final product. We ran a number of tests. One was to find the accuracy of our temperature readings. To do this, we heated beer up to 92 degrees Celsius, and we let it fall in temperature. We took readings every two degrees Celsius drop, and we compared our values with a comparison thermocouple. We were within half a degree Celsius of our comparison readings, and this is mostly due to the latency of our thermocouple, considering it's larger and thicker than our comparison. To eliminate this variable, we brought our beer up to 100 degrees Celsius, which is boiling, and also down to just above freezing, zero degrees Celsius. And we held our temperature there, and we took measurements. We were within 0.2 degrees Celsius of our comparison readings when we did that test. Now we actually beer, we actually brewed a German coal style beer using our system and the home brewing setup of our advisor. As you can see in red is our ideal temperature path throughout the mash process. It has specific temperatures that we need to hit at specific times. And in blue is our actual measured values. As you can see, we followed the path pretty well. There was some variation, but that's mostly due to the behavior of our home brewing setup. Now, we were lucky enough to receive $750 in funding from the source office here on campus, and we came up with a hardware budget of $111 to recreate our temperature module. Our second module, which is the color detection module, uh, was there to confirm the consistency and efficiency of uh, each brew. This is our final color detection module, again, the custom 3D design case and our custom PCB boards. Standard reference method is not only a, a standard method used by the beer industry, but it is also a unit of measurement uh, to measure the yellowness of each uh, of the beer. Then, Sorry. Sorry, uh, the SRM uh, is uh, calculated using uh, that equation and uh, I would like to draw your attention to uh, the uh, calculation for the attenuation of light at 430 nanometers, which is the log ratio of I over I naught, I being the intensity into the sample, and I, and I naught being the intensity out of the sample. Thank you, ma'am. This is our software design. It starts off by initializing the system. The first uh, our base measurement, which is I, is calculated using an empty cubic. Then we have a second calculation, which is the I naught that is calculated using a QVEC filled with your desired beer. This ratio is then used to calculate the attenuation of like a 430 nanometers. Um, this is our hardware design. At the heart of our hardware design, we have a PIC 18 microcontroller. The system technically works where you have an LED that produces light at 430 nanometers. You have a photometric sensor that uh, picks up, uh, that is sensitive to 430 nanometers uh, as the light is attenuated through each of these cubits. Uh, this value is then sent through to the PIC using ABC. The PIC then, uh, using USAR, would then send this uh, value, uh, the SRM calculated uh, value, to the base station using um, uh, the XP. Um, um, using XP. This is our PCB design. 
uh, which we uh, designed in Eagle, and then we had it custom made. I know it looks very similar to the um, temperature system, but it is different. Uh, our uh, color test, we had several color tests that uh, uh, we, uh, um, that we have, uh, performed. Uh, the challenge with this basically was initially finding SIM values uh, or a database with SIM values. Eventually we stumbled across Firestone Walker Brewing Company. They, uh, um, on their website, they publicized all the SRM values for each of the beers that they brew. And this is what we used to basically uh, figure out how uh, consistent uh, and efficient uh, our uh, system is. Um, in blue is the target values that they had for each uh, of these uh, beers. Uh, but I also like to uh, inform you that there is a range uh, for SRM values. So ideally 8 would be the target, but it would uh, uh, technically fall between 6 and 10. Uh, as Grant mentioned, uh, we uh, brewed our own German cold style beer, this having an SRM range between 3 and 6, and we measured a 4.79, which meant that we were in style. This is our uh, hardware budget, and for us to be able to replicate the system, uh, it will only cost $91 versus a complete uh, uh, versus an industry model at uh, 13,000. So the final module that we developed was our base station module. As you can see, it's a tablet-like device, uh, has a touch screen, uh, and it's meant for the user to be able to interact with the full system. Um, at the heart of it is a Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, and then there's an XB attached to it for communication with uh, the other two modules. Um, and then there's a 7-inch touchscreen as well. There's a fully customized GUI that we built out for this that uh, reads out the live temperature readings uh, and plots them for you. You can also turn on and off different brews in this section. Uh, you can turn on and off reading different temperatures. There's also a kill switch so that you can end the process if anything goes awry. Um, and then finally, this is where uh, the SRM values are stored and where all the PID calculations are also performed and then sent out to the temperature module. Uh, it would cost around $187 to completely remake the base station module. This is an overview of our entire system. As you see, the temperature module interacts with our mash and boil kettle to provide consistent brewing conditions. Our color module uses the finished beer as a means for quality control and our base station interfaces wirelessly with both modules to provide the user with information and control of each module. Now, to recreate the hardware for our entire system, it would cost $389. To try to do this with commercially available products, it would cost upwards of $13,000, which means our system is a low-cost option for brewers to implement automation and quality control into their brewing process. Uh, at the beginning of this project, we did a full risk burn down analysis, which consisted of us identifying each and every risk that we thought could possibly interfere with our project, um, and then assessing it a risk priority number, or RPN, uh, that's graded on the scale of the currency, severity, and our personal control over that risk. Um, at the end of this uh, exercise, when we started the project, we identified 33 individual risks with a total RPN of 7,429. Back in December when we gave our uh, funding proposal, we were slightly ahead of schedule with our risk at 6,752. 6, um, and then today you can see uh, we are also ahead of our risk, but you can also see all the challenges that we face throughout the course of this project. Uh, this is anywhere from troubleshooting, uh, parts not coming in on time, um, anything that you would face throughout the course of a regular project can really be seen in this uh, graph. And we feel that this is where you can see a lot of the learning happening. We had several challenges, um, and one of the challenges we faced uh, was um, Fusion 360 because we had to design a 3D custom uh, um, uh, a case for our uh, color module because it needed a one, uh, um, the optical length needed to be one centimeter, and so uh, that was a challenge for us because we never used uh, Fusion 360 before. Another one of our challenges was the PID algorithm. It took a lot of time and effort to tune it exactly to our own brewing setup. Uh, and then one of the other, other challenges we face is that our wireless communication, we had never used XBs before. So learning this technology and getting it to, the work, to work to the point where um, it worked very consistently for our projects was also a very large challenge for us. 
In regards to the future works, uh, we'd like to implement pulse width modulation on our temperature module to provide more precision when controlling our reloading. Uh, and we'd also like to make the base station and color module have their own batteries. Uh, we'd also thought that it might be a good idea for the color module to be its own standalone device with its own screen, GUI, and battery enclosed. Um, yeah. And finally, we're thinking of uh, doing a stability sensor. A stability sensor is technically just a sensor that can uh, identify the haziness uh, in a beer because it um, interferes with the SRM, SRM reading uh, when you measure your beer. Uh, these are some of our supporting courses, and then we welcome comments and questions. Yeah, in going uh, in, in the core detection, uh, for when it comes to a different uh, beer that you're using, what, how do you do that accurately to detect the color when you go from one beer type to another? Okay, so as uh, one of our slides um, uh, showed basically the chart. Uh, so there's an SRM range basically for each beer that usually goes between two and three. So that is the range, uh, or six and eight. But however, what the, these companies have, they have a target value that they ideally would like to get. And so, uh, so what we like to do in our system basically is is uh, um, try and hit for their target value which we did very closely because if you remember uh, one of our slides, our biggest deviation was actually 1.1, but that's technically the thing. Uh, so there's no real calibration to the whole system. It's just there's a range, there's an ideal target, and we would like to uh, uh, hit uh, uh, in, um, the target. And the process is the same for every beer. You take a baseline reading of the initial light entering sample, and you take a reading with the actual beer in it to provide the light being attenuated just by the beer. So that works for all different types of beer. Uh, we did focus only on SRM values from 2 to 20, which is about Pilsners to some very dark ales, but we, weren't, we didn't focus on the stats because our client only wanted 2 to 20. Did you wrote hand up first. So uh, could you touch a little more on your wireless communication? Because on your chart, it looked like it was you are going to XB. So did you have lots of issues? I mean, is that just blasting the information continuously, just like broadcast data continuously? Or is there some sort of actual transaction happening? Well, How do you handle that? We started with just broadcasting the data continuously every uh, 10 seconds. Uh, but we did encounter some issues with capturing that data on our Raspberry Pi. So we instead switched to the Pi sends out command to the microcontroller to get the temperature readings. And even then, we were having some trouble capturing that data back on the Raspberry Pi side. Um, but uh, yeah, there was also, we also initiated a whole protocol for how we would send data. So there was like, we initiated, uh, we would send a signal to the, one of the modules, it would send the character back, we would check it, it was good, um, and then we would go from there and it would just send out packets of information. And also, uh, if we had a bunch of, if we had missing data for whatever reason, um, we set up a protocol to reset our temperature module wires from our Raspberry Pi just to increase some reliability just in case something happened. Yeah, thank you. Uh, when you did your system design originally, was there a specific reason you chose a proprietary hub controller with Zigbee as opposed to, say, Bluetooth and a standard smart device, smartphone? We chose Zigbee at first because it was easy to connect. It didn't require any type of pairing. Um, but working with it, I think we would like to use Bluetooth in the future, especially since it's implemented into many different devices. You wouldn't have to buy a separate module for a base station. Your system cost then could be a lot lower. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. Yeah. When you did your temperature control, you tuned it to one particular brewer's system. Yeah. What would you do if you had alternative sizes, or if you uh, how do you accommodate different amounts of water in the stability of that control? Yeah, we like to um, to create kind of a um, I'm not sure to call it protocol just. Some method uh, that we can program that would automatically test a uh, homebrew system. Um, I'm not sure how difficult that would be. That would be something in the future we look into. But we also originally had the PID implemented on our temperature module, the microcontroller, originally. 
then we ran into the issue of what happens when a user wants to tune their, to their system. So it would be difficult for them to access the uh, programming on the temperature module. So that's why we moved it to the base station to allow for more user uh, so you can, functionality. So you can change all the, all the, all the different uh, P and I terms within yeah. that. So you can technically calibrate it to your system. Um, it would take some trial and error, but yeah. John? What is PID and why was this algorithm chosen for your feedback? It stands for proportional integral and derivative. It's a uh, control loop feedback mechanism that just allows us to reach certain temperatures that we set very quickly while reducing the overshoot quite a lot because that could be an issue, especially in um, thermal systems. Yep. So I'm curious, are you going to continue using the hardware? that you developed? <laughs> Are you actually, is it actually made your uh, home brewing process better? Um, it's, the beer that we produced in German Kolsch was very good. <laughs> Happy to report. Um, and it has made the process a lot better. According to our advisor, that was probably the most consistent temperature he's ever had when because we used his home brewing setup. Ah, thank yeah. God. Yeah. And how much beer did you consume in the... Is there going to be a tasting? Uh, we were, we, we, we tried to set that up here, but uh, maybe if you can come to meet us after, we'll have we'll the juice and so. And you won't be disappointed. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? That was a difficult one to pull. Huh? It was. Say it again? That was a difficult one to pull. Yeah. <laughs> moments to just uh, talk about my experience here. As I said, Farid has uh, been great to uh, let me work with the teams here for the last few years. I've been actually involved in the Sonoma State uh, system for about eight years now. 
across the business school, the engineering school, and also very heavily involved in the makerspace we've created here. If you guys haven't had a chance to experience what we've got going on at the library with the makerspace, I encourage you to stop by and take a look or uh, let me know and I'll take you over and give you a tour. So there's some phenomenal things happening here at the university. And, uh, and I really am proud to be able to be a part of it. I find that the, the university environment here is very unique in my experience in that every one of the faculty and the staff all the way from the deans down are very, very invested in the student's success and making that happen. That, that wasn't exactly the way it was when I went to school and we had 60,000 undergrads in the school that I went to. So I'm really excited about being part of that and it, it makes a big difference, I think. I also wanted to talk about my experience in kind of getting to work with the senior design programs here. I've been a mentor to basically all the teams here and a, and a sponsor and uh, and individual uh, work with several of the teams on some of the ideas. And I find it to be an incredibly rewarding experience to get a chance to watch the transformation we go through, right? So we talked about the last few days we've been doing dry runs and trying to get them ready to stand up here and do a presentation, which is not an easy thing to do. We're standing up in front of a bunch of engineering people and say, you know, here, let's let them grill you on anything they could ask. And I'm really proud of where they've come. But the, the big thing is the transformation you see from the beginning of the year when they're taking the educational experience and turning it into real world experience where they come up with things here that are pretty amazing and could actually turn into a product. And that's, that's something that does an incredible job of building confidence in the young people. And I, I really appreciate what I get a chance to be a part of to see that and make it happen, right? So actually a few months ago, we, uh, we had a reunion here with a lot of the alumni that stood up here and some from, you know, that had gone on to other things. And it was really great to hear how they responded to the jobs when they got into the world of the, of the working world and the real environment. And also how their bosses were really impressed with what they could actually do by hitting the ground running and, and be able to make a contribution right away. And also what they felt about their career. One, one young man that I uh, talked to was really amazing to, to hear his story because he told me about being able to be able to graduate here and then go work on his lifelong dream where he was now, he's now a uh, Imagineer at Disney working on the latest Star Wars ride that's going to come out, right? So I, thought, I also thought that was an appropriate story for May the 4th, right? <laughs> so let me grab a couple more notes here that I had jotted down real quick to want to make sure I cover. but. Uh, I really think that uh, the real emphasis for me is about the personal reward I've seen in terms of being able to be involved in so many of these projects, watch what's going on with the engineers, see them be able to take this and get excited about what happens there. And then we've also got an initiative we're putting together with not only Farid and the engineering school here, but also crossing boundaries over with the business school and working with the entrepreneurial programs at the business school, right? So we actually have some of the uh, students here today from the entrepreneurial program, and we're trying to expand this into more of a total in innovation initiative across that. And we really would like to get more and more of the local industry involved in that program as well, right? So we've got a lot of great sponsors already, but we want to kind of beyond, go beyond that and build some things up as we move forward and, and have a great program here that works into the future. So I jotted down some notes here about some of the things that we've got set up already. Um, trying to encourage more people to get involved in that. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. And you know, I can talk to you more at the break and I'd love to, love to uh, have you come up and let's talk some more about the experiences with some of those stuff. But one of the first ones is just mentorship. And I'm not talking about a big commitment on any of this stuff, right? If you could just spare a couple of hours a year, that can make a big difference in someone's life. But being able to have industry mentors that can talk to the students about what's actually happening. I was just in a lecture, uh, giving a lecture to one of the classes here, and I got a lot of great feedback from the students that they really love hearing from somebody that's actually been in the industry and, and does the work and sees what's going on and, and gets a chance to answer their questions and get a direct feedback from that it makes a huge difference. It doesn't take a big investment of someone's time. So if you've got some spare time for mentorship, we do a lot of internships. I know uh, our small company, we've uh, been through, I think I counted 11 interns so far, both from the business school and the engineering school. Several of those we turned into full-time hires and had some great results from that. So we're very excited about that. But uh, the internship experience is a great experience on both sides of the street. So think about that if you've got any opportunities. Uh, we also look for industry instructors, so bringing people in, like I just mentioned I did, bringing people in from industry and doing a lecture. We have the, uh, we could do a classroom lecture. We also have an engineering lecture series that we do as a, as a uh, ongoing 
series of different lectures for different topics where we bring in people, not only the students, but people from outside industry as well is a great opportunity for doing that. Also, continuing education. We would love to work with uh, yourselves or anybody in your companies that are interested in kind of continuing education and keeping up with the latest technology and doing stuff, being involved with the university program is really important in that. So let me know if there's anything to do there. Of course, we're always looking for any other ways to get involved. Look for ways to donate your time, to, do, to donate uh, equipment or software or something else that might help to do that. And uh, obviously, you know, we can always use money to support a lot of these things going on too. So there's lots of ways to get involved. I'd like to talk to you some more about that. I want to see this evolve into more of a bigger innovation series. How many of you guys would like to see some of this stuff actually get to market and, and turn into a real product, right? I think that would be a great thing if you start seeing some of that going. So I'd like to see ongoing work on that. So that would be great as well. So anything you could do to help us out. I'd love to get your ideas and feedback on other things that we might be able to do, not just the ones we've already spelled out here. So let's talk about that some more and see what's happening. So please take a, a moment to introduce yourself to, to me at the break here. We'll give you a, a break and get a chance to go around and see all these wonderful <coughs> projects or introduce yourself to Fareed and let's talk some more about what we can do or anybody else you know that might want to get involved in the program. So let me know. So. One thing I can do is I can promise you that if you do get involved, it'll be a very rewarding experience. I can tell you from, from my own personal experience in that. So I don't want to take too much of your time. I want to make sure we all get a chance to go to break and see all these wonderful projects. But I did want to take one more chance to, to get a round of applause for all the hard work that the engineers and, and the faculty put into this whole program. So thank you. Uh, we have a purple folder just in case anyone is interested to see how you can involve, get involved in the program. There's also a small card in there and uh, you can always put your information in so we can contact you in case you're available to, to help us, to collaborate at any capacity. It would be great to have you next year. Thank you so much and perhaps you can come back in about 20 minutes. Thank you. We have the Soba Regatta event um, today and tomorrow. Dr. Cassis over there, raise your hand. Uh, she is the faculty sponsor for this event. She is also the faculty sponsor for Women in Tech. Um, this event, the Soba Regatta, has been a great segue to the senior design project. Uh, in this effort, we have a number of junior, uh, more like freshmen and sophomores. Some of the junior students have been involved in solar, solar regatta project. The project is basically building a boat which works with solar panels. So these guys, the student, engineering students from the United States tomorrow, they have their own boats and they're actually going to Sacramento to try it on the river. And I know last year, I, I believe they actually came first, uh, thanks to Dr. Cassidy second. Well, who is going but almost. So, um, this is really, this has been a great experience for a lot of our students who are participating in the event, in particular in terms of team building and project management and problem solving and concept design. The students basically put everything together, and most of the students that we've had so far, that they basically go through this program, thanks to Dr. Cassis, and then after that they go to the senior project, they really have had a great experience, so they're really ready once they get the senior design project. So if you'd like to get more information about the event, which again, these guys are leaving at 1 o'clock, so we're going to have Dr. Cassis here for only a few more minutes. Um, but it would be great if you get, a, get to chat with her and get more information. Okay, anything I missed? Are we good? Alright, thanks again. And uh, without further ado, we're going to go to the next presentation. Ready? Okay, I am Abdo and my partner Isaac. Uh, we are our project is a smart car in collaboration with the switch vehicles. So this is the overview of our project. Um, we will show you the problem, um, the requirements, uh, the current test results and challenges that we are facing, and actually who are the switch vehicles. 
So switch vehicle is a local company at Sebastopol. They make these electric vehicles and sell it to customers. Not only to the customers, but they also sell these vehicles to the educational uh, department. So they can uh, educate kids about their technology. They also make these educational kits. Uh, so for the department that cannot afford the whole vehicle, so they can learn from this educational kit. Um, when they came to the department um, and they proposed the project, we found a couple of problems with this educational kit. First of all, it does not replicate the actual vehicle. Uh, it also consumes two watt of energy and it cannot be integrated into the actual vehicle. So, we wanted to make the educational kit basically, to enhance it and to enhance it based on the actual vehicle hardware. We wanted to control the basic functionality of the vehicle, mm -hmm. such as turning the vehicle on and off, uh, lights on off, change the direction, and to control the speed of the motor. In actual case, it's only on and off, but we wanted to control the speed of it. We wanted to use the wireless technology to send commands from an Android phone. And our add-on feature to the system is to put a LADAR to detect objects and alert driver, and basically enhancing the educational kit. So we will use the smartphone, we, our system can be placed on actual vehicle, and through Bluetooth, we can have communication. Okay, so these are some of the marketing requirements that were established when we spoke to switch vehicles. And uh, at least have a Bluetooth communication of at least 15 feet, so that when there's a group of people, 15 feet should be enough. And also, uh, as Abdul said, you know, turn the car on and off, uh, toggle the lights on and off, uh, put the, be able to put the vehicle forward and reverse, and also speed control of the motor. And we really want the system to consume less than a watt because this is an electric vehicle and we don't want to be taking too much energy. And, yeah. So, we will be using an embedded system called the Arduino, and it's a nano. And it's going to be used to... Uh, be paired to help pair with the Bluetooth and also we're going to use some relays to help with isolation between the 12 volt system and the 5 volt system and in order to reduce overall system power usage we um, decided to do some computing reduction in power and also uh, fix some voltage changes between 12 and 5 volts and being able to do that efficiently and we will be using PWM for to supply zero to five volts in order to control the motor. And the system will be in a 10 by six by four enclosure. So this is a high level diagram of what our system kind of looks like. And as you can see, we have two embedded systems. One is in charge of the display of the information and the other one is in charge of collecting information from the sensor. And the other one actually receives control from the Bluetooth, from the Android app and then from, through Bluetooth. And then it sends to either our test board or the actual Curtis box, which is the motor controller in the vehicle. And so this is looking into the Curtis controller, which is that little box I had there. And this is what we use to control the speed of the motor. So the, the motor controller has an input, which receives zero to five volts. And this is what we use to achieve that. And in this case, since this test was not applied to the vehicle, it was actually applied to the test board, um, we are using uh, 12 volts to control this motor. And so from, from, from the PWM, we actually have a filtering circuit which helps smooth out the, the output and gives us a clean 0 to 5 or 0 to 12 volts in this case. And continuing on the Curtis control, we have this relay module which is used to control the, the 12 volt system. And from there, we control basic uh, on-off of the car, lights on-off, um, and also the motor controller accepts 12 volts either to turn on the car or to put it in reverse. And this is one of our tests that we conducted that we had a hard time uh, reducing power usage. Initially, we started off with the Arduino Duo, which consumes a lot, like you can see there, 108 milliamps, and we had two of those. And so from there, we were consuming about seven, eight watts, so which was very not good. <laughs> so from there, we moved on to the Arduino Mega, which consumes 40 watts, 40 milliamps. And from there, we kept moving down to eventually getting to eight milliamps per, 
per device. And finally, here you can see, uh, here we use a switching regulator instead of a linear one, because we, at first we started off using the linear regulator that's supplied in the Arduino, and that was really bad. Then we moved to another one, when, and then we, we found out that was also a linear regulator, which we had to do some more research, and we found out that this one was a lot better, which is a switching regulator, and it allowed us to get a peak efficiency of 74%. This is our software design. Um, once the app is built on a cell phone, you can send characters. Uh, so basically, we are sending four different characters to turn the relays on and off. And in order to turn the uh, to run the motor, we are sending zero to two fifty five analog integer because it's an eight bit uh, TWM that we wanted to control. So basically, we are sending these zero to two fifty five analog integers uh, in order to change the weight of the pulse width modulation, and then that's how. It's changing the speed. And this is the output that we get from uh, PWM uh, having the R RC low pass right after it. And then that goes into the base of the NPN transistor. So with a small amount of current, we are trying to control the larger current of a 12 volt DC motor. So for the app, we use this MIT app inventor. Uh, it's a, a platform that is available, anyone can use it, they can make their app, and uh, after when it's completed the app, uh, it gives you the QR code, and you just scan it, and the app is installed on your phone, which was really a good platform uh, so that uh, students can use it, because the whole purpose was educational purposes. For educational purposes, it was really important to use something so that everyone can have access to it. And so here, we included some LiDAR testing. We actually have a LiDAR in our system, but it, the testing is not complete on that, so we decided to include a little bit. And here, uh, we, as you can see, we took like a really big red poster, and we actually tried moving into and out of the blind spots of this car. And we were able to determine, you know, some angles and, and some uh, distances of where the blind spot is located for that specific vehicle. And from there, we're able to determine how the LiDAR could be positioned and, and how far it could reach out into the blind spot. So this is how our actual system looked like, which completely enhanced the current educational kit, which is also sitting right here. Uh, we are showing what's going on inside in the system. Uh, the connector inputs 12 volt to our system that goes to the voltage regulator. And then from there, it supplies 5 volt to each component. Uh, and we are consuming 0 uh, 0.4 watt uh, and at an uh, idle situation. We are not sending anything. It's just system is on and that's how much it's consuming. So this is our final price. This is actually what the very uh, top of what we uh, spent on our products. Um, but we actually ended up using all of the $600 that were supplied to us by the source funding. Uh, those three, those other three hundred dollars were included in testing because we bought, as you saw earlier, we bought all these different uh, modules, uh, all these embedded systems, and that we didn't end up using because of power consumption. So a lot of money went there, and and we used a lot of it just for testing. Challenges. Um, we had a lot of challenges to design a system to have one embedded system instead of two separate. But we were also looking at the power consumption. Uh, at the same time, the nano that we used are two different nano because one offered one serial communication and we needed two serial communication for our system. Uh, working with the switch lab was a huge, huge challenge for us. And for every single test, we had to go to their lab. Um, another unfortunate thing that happened is that they only worked with us until December. Uh, we came back in January and we wanted to do further testing. Uh, they sold that uh, test bench to some other customer and they say that uh, once they get another test bench for us, uh, then they, we can come and do further testing. Unfortunately, until now we did not hear anything from them, uh, but we continue our work. Um, and this is the schedule. And so as for the schedule, it seems kind of okay, but we had some rough, rough patches here and there. And uh, so we actually, that what Abdul said, set us back because from there we had to actually construct the test board and uh, make sure that our outputs were compatible with the way we designed our test board. And as you can see here, um, there was some time spent and a, a lot of that time that we could have put on the LiDAR sensor was not really 
was not really taken advantage of. Future work uh, probably requires a lot of work in a free blind spot system uh, to detect properly uh, if there is something in the blind spot. And since future vehicle um, did not provide us opportunity to work on actual vehicle, we think that if we were had a chance to work on actual vehicle, we would we could have solved a lot of technical issues that we are facing. Um, like for example, the speed control could be improved a lot when we were working on actual vehicle. Uh, similarly, like other small technical issues could be solved if we had a chance. These are the supporting courses that help us to understand the basics and some of the references. If you guys have questions and comments. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, can you tell us why you picked the uh, uh, LiDAR instead of hot technologies? So well, we're trying to be a little different, and uh, we, we looked at uh, ultrasonic sensors, we looked at radar and other stuff, and <coughs> what was really most popular or used for distance measuring was the LiDAR. So we didn't really focus on um, blind spot of how it's currently used, but more of what's good out there for measuring distance. And so we were trying to be a little different, and we found out it works pretty okay for the most part, but uh, it's a it's a low cost option for using more either other type of system like radar. And what are the shortcomings? Are there any shortcomings? Yes. So it's actually dangerous to look into the lidar. Obviously, uh, it's a laser based system, so uh, you don't want to look at it. And. Uh, also, since it's a laser-based system, uh, you know, because those cars are kind of slanted, so you, you, sometimes you won't, might not get a reading because uh, the laser goes somewhere else. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. So in, in the future, I'm kind of curious where you see this going in the sense of some of these sensors are incredibly sensitive and may pick up hazards that don't really exist. And so, do you envision your sensors as being able to lock the user out of controlling the car, or do you envision the user being able to override the sensors, or have you thought about that at all? The whole purpose was to transform the educational case, and right. that's what I mentioned. If we had a chance to work on actual vehicle, we would be like getting uh, actual like uh, measurement, and we could have asked their help that what's available in the market, so we can start from there and not jumping into something that we have no idea. And that's what uh, most of our funding went into as well. Um, we need like a lot of uh, information and study in terms of sensor technology on actual vehicle. But for the educational purposes, it does its basic job. Uh, how, how did you choose the, the values of the circuit elements in your your first circuit? In the, in your <coughs> what which value? The circuit the, the capacitor and the resistor in your circuit in the first slide. Okay, so uh, choosing RC depends on the design. If you choose high RC, you can reduce the ripples, but it increases the amount of time that you are sending uh, characters to your uh, and the response time basically you're increasing that. In our system, we, what we what we found is that we don't need to uh, filter the ripples that much uh, because our system works with it. What we wanted to do is uh, to reduce that response time. So basic R RC values work for us, just like a normal RC values, not like a very high RC, uh, like for 2.2 2 and then 2.2 microfarad and 2.2 uh, kilo ohm work for us. Okay, um, and how did you measure the, the efficiency of yours? You had a plot showing efficiency versus your current. How did you measure that? That was... Yeah, so that, we actually measured uh, the voltage coming out and also the current coming out of the system using a, a power supply. So we measure, the, we, we, we look at the power supply, it tells us how much current is coming out, is, is the, our system is pulling. And then from there, we also have a multimeter on, our, on, uh, on the output of our voltage regulator to see how much uh, it's actually going through, going into our system after the voltage regulator. So then we put um, the power used, the power output over the power input, and then we try to, actually make this curve as, as we increase the, the amperage. Okay. 
Um, and the PWM is part of the, the voltage regulation? Is where no, that, that's done through the Arduino, the PWM. Okay. But what is it, what is it controlling, like the width of each pulse? It's controlling the width of the pulse. So as you increase the width of the pulse, you're increasing uh, the amount of current that flows into the NPN transistor. And then from there, you're controlling how much current. Thank you. So if you were to look at the power budget again, um, how would you go through that process? Um, so you look at the power budget, and you said you, you ended up with a number of different um, boards that you were looking at, yeah. but if you were to go back, could you look at the circuit diagram to begin with to see what the power consumption was like? Could you look at the process? So what would be your process? I would say, uh, honestly, the good process would be whenever you are ordering parts, please grab the data sheet, and that's the good advice for all the upcoming uh, engineering students. Because if you just look at the Amazon price is cheap, the product will be reached in within two days, that's not a good choice. You always get the data sheet to see what's coming in, coming, what's going to come out, and then based on that, you order your part, and then you will be good. So I was curious, you mentioned about isolation between the lower layer and high voltage. Yes. Uh, you did it by active isolation, you have some transformers or something like that? No, we're, we're using relays, so they're, they're, like, they're just switches, but that are controlled uh, electromagnetically by applying a current and a voltage on one side. And uh, that just activates the switch and it closes the, 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 the circuit that goes that runs the 12 volts. Oh, okay. Good question. On your uh, basic curve, motor control circuit. You are having a, a diode there across the motor, right? Yeah. 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 So what oh, is the purpose of that? The, the purpose of the diode is to save our system from reverse EMF. Because if the motor spins, it has a, um, that it, it has it, it it puts inputs the search back. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So in order to save our system from that we use this diode. Really? So, what is the power requirement on this diode? How much power should handle? It should handle uh, at least like 200 milliamp. For the for the motor, it can use like 200 milliamp. But I think the one end is a very small signal type, very low power. That might be the type of error over there. Uh, but we use it that is more than 200 milliamp in order to control. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you so much for coming. Technical difficulties?
Hi everyone, my name is Randy. Uh, my name is Giovanni. And we are Solar Energy Monitoring System, the number one solution for standalone solar monitoring. So as you heard five times already, uh, we're going to go over the problem uh, in today's solar monitoring uh, solutions and we're going to give you the proposal how we plan to solve this problem. We're going to go over a technical overview um, and then from there we're going to switch over to our software design. We're going to go over a few tests that we did and the data we collected from those tests. And then with that data, a real-world application you can use with our product. From there, we're going to jump into a brief conclusion and wrap it up nicely. All right, so according to the International Energy Agency, uh, solar power is going to be the largest uh, electrical power by 2050. So when you hear that, you can, you know, here in uh, power, solar power in the future, uh, maybe you, you're thinking about making the switch to solar power. And then you get your quote from your um, solar company, and you see that it's $10,000. And, you know, even more than that, and you're thinking, oh, man, is it worth it? And you do your, you, know, you want more than an online calculator. You want something more than that. And what if there was a local device that is going to help you make that decision better, you know, to feel more confident about the fact that you just know, so what we propose, so what we propose is designing a low-cost standalone solar monitoring system to help you make that decision, to help potential investors in the solar uh, make an educated decision, so they're not spending ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, and it turned out it wasn't worth it. Currently, there are solar monitors out there on the market. Companies such as Enphase and Solar Edge. Uh, all offer solar monitoring solutions, however, they are very expensive. Some of them are free apps, but they require already deployed solar systems currently in place and operational. Um, this defeats the purpose of low cost, and you, all, like, you already have to make that leap into solar. So we went out and we conducted our customer surveys, and we asked, uh, random people, we asked them questions, and we started off with, are you invested in solar? And the ones that answered no, we asked them, well, why not? And they said, because of cost. Cost was a big one. That, that's how we came up with our first marketing requirement, is low cost. They wanted something small and easy to carry around, so they're not lugging around a big suitcase. They wanted something 24 hours, just let it rip, set it and forget it, and don't worry about it. They wanted it to be web accessible. They didn't want it to have a screen that you have to go up to your roof and look at it. They want to just look at it on their phone or computer, whatever it may be. And they wanted it to be weatherproof so they can, see, like, like I said, set it and forget it. From there, we came up with our engineering requirements. The first one being a 25 watt solar panel. And we opted to use a 25 watt solar panel because of cost and size and just overall ease of use. We needed a regulator to regulate the variable voltage coming from the solar panel down to five or the charging circuit. Um, the list goes on and on, but the, another one I'm trying to highlight is the uh, 66 milliamp hour lithium battery pack, which enables us to have a lifespan of uh, 48 hours if you were to lose sunlight for 48 hours. On the left is a picture of our prototype. It's sitting on our booth right now. We'll look at it after this presentation. And on the right is a technical overview of how we uh, implemented this design. So on, it doesn't work. on the top left, you see the solar panel uh, inputting voltage into the relay. The relay switches between a measurement circuit and a charging circuit. We're using a normally closed relay, so normally it's charging the battery. Then when it receives a GPIO signal from the Raspberry Pi, it switches over to a measurement circuit, which then sends the voltage coming from the solar panel to the INA219 current sensor. And then from the sensor, it goes into a load, and then we take that measurement with the Raspberry Pi via I squared C communication. From the Raspberry Pi, it goes up into the cloud and then gets plotted on a ThingSpeak server, which then you can see online on the computer. Here we have our software design. So every 30 minutes, we have a Python script running that takes the measurement. First, we establish connection with the cloud, and then we initialize our sensor. We send a GPIO signal to the relay, which opens the relay, sends the, current, sends the voltage of current to the sensor, 
We collect that data, and that data is then saved in a CSV file. From the CSV file, we're also sending it to the, or to the cloud to be plotted on the speed server. From there, it goes into idle, and the script is done running. It goes into idle, um, and then we have a Linux utility uh, called cron that we schedule the Python script to run every 30 minutes to save power. This can be user defined to 30 minutes, one hour, whatever you want it to be. But we're doing 30 minutes. Here's our budget. I'm not going to go over everything, but I do want to highlight two points. One is the total price of $150, roughly, $156. The second one being the solar panel. Um, it's the most expensive item on the list at $40. However, you can opt out not to not to use our solar panel if you have your own. Say you have your own solar panel and you want to connect that instead. All what you need to do is modify our design slightly and then you can use your own solar panel. And that would bring the cost down to roughly $116. So for $116, you could potentially save yourself ten or $20,000. So once we have our requirements, we came up with this schedule. And if you look at it, it's, it looks nice and it, pretty much everything looks even. But um, you know, we wanted to spend two or three weeks on each module and we found that that's one of the things that we learned in this presentation and in this project, that not everything is gonna go the way that you want it to go. <coughs> so we faced uh, a lot of challenges uh, in this project and the main one, the biggest one was battery life. You know, that's besides uh, you know, blowing up sensors, relays, and microcontrollers. Uh, battery life was the biggest one. Um, why to, because our device is self-powered, uh, we need the battery to last. And because one of our requirements was 24 hours, we needed the battery to, to last at least 24 hours. So power consumption was the biggest one. Um, then Wi-Fi connectivity. So if you're trying to connect to Wi-Fi and you don't have a screen, it's pretty tough to do. So that was another thing, you know, uh, sensor configurations. So we spent a lot of time, you know, taking measurements and, you know, you have everything right. You have everything connected the way it's supposed to be and it's just not working. And it's so frustrating and it's like, what's going on? I don't know what I did wrong. So you go to the configuration file and you see that that was wrong. And, you know, to find that problem, you know, can take you days. Can take, can you can take you hours. And uh, the other one was scheduling, you know, Randy and I, we both work full time, we have jobs. And sometimes it was pretty, difficult to meet up and you know, work together. But uh, another thing that we learned in this project was to you know, make everything possible to meet the deadlines. That's um, the revised schedule. So if you uh, look at the diagram, the battery, we were working on, uh, on that until two weeks ago. That took a long time you know, because power consumption was uh, a really big deal for us. So now we're going to jump into testing. Um, we have a complete list of all the tests we conducted on our document, which is on our website. Uh, feel free to look at it if you want. But we're only going to go over four today. And the first one being is characterizing our 25 watt solar panel. So the first test we're going to talk about is characterizing our 25 watt solar panel. Um, so we went out on a clear day, sunny as can be, in direct sunlight. We hooked up our solar panel to a 500 ohm variable resistor, that which we then measure the voltage and current across that resistor using a Fluke 115 volt meter. We brought down the resistance from 500 ohms all the way down to about 20 ohms where we found <coughs> our maximum power point being roughly 17.86 watts. And then that power point is found at the knee of this IV curve. This gave us the load which we have to set our, uh, this, this gave us the value which we have to set our load at in order to get an accurate uh, measurement using our INA to maintain current sensor. Next we wanted to measure the accuracy of the INA 219 sensor. So what we did was we hooked it up to a power supply, measured the voltage and current coming out of the power supply, and then took a uh, calculated power coming out of the power supply. We then compared those with values that the INA219 was reading, and we found out that it had an accuracy of 98, roughly 98 point, roughly 98 percent. Um, if anything, this just goes to show that my power supply I'm using at home is very not accurate. So, uh, 
Our next test is the battery charging test. We just, the purpose of this was to verify that the system would charge during sunlight hours <coughs> and discharge uh, slow enough that it would last for up to 24 hours. And it did, um, as you can see, well, the laser pointer's dying, but those, where it goes up, those are the sunlight hours, and then at roughly my balcony uh, at 6 p.m., it starts to discharge. That's where I lose sunlight, it's roughly 6 p.m. So during, at nighttime, it starts to discharge slowly up until 6 a.m. the next morning, and then it just kind of, you know, charges up and rises back up again. Um, we have an average system current of 141 milliamps, which would theoretically give us a battery lifespan of 46 hours, 46.81 hours. So that, that completely, that completely uh, surpasses our engineering requirement of 24 hours. Next was the Raspberry Pi power consumption. We originally were using the Raspberry Pi, uh, Raspberry Pi 3 Model B, but then we realized it draws just way too much power. Um, so we started testing the Raspberry Pi Zero, and we concluded that the Raspberry Pi Zero draws almost half, like about half as much power as the Raspberry Pi 3. So we, you know, for size and power uh, limitations, we decided to use the uh, Raspberry Pi Zero. Um, it gave us everything we need to, the Wi-Fi connectivity, but just smaller and slower, but we don't need the power uh, associated with the Raspberry Pi 3. So with all the data we're collecting, voltage, current, and power, and battery voltage to monitor, uh, we visualize this data using ThingSpeak. ThingSpeak is an IoT platform that we can send data to, and it'll it's, it's MATLAB based, so you can write a MATLAB code and then it'll spit out a graph for you. Um, this is over the span of a day um, on my balcony here in Leonard Park, so uh, I can already tell you my balcony isn't the best place for solar power, but uh, it's just how it is. Um, and again, here's the battery discharge curve, or discharging rate. Here's a, a, a screenshot of our website, which I encourage you to go look at after this presentation, um, where not only can you see the data that we're being, not only can you see the data that's being plotted, but it provides an ed excellent educational tool to learn about voltage, to learn about current. Say you don't know anything about voltage or current or power or whatever, you can learn about these things. And help, it'll help you make a better decision uh, investing in solar. Um, not only that, but advanced users can download the data that we're being sent, uh, that we're sending. Uh, via CSV files. So you click on a link and you can download either each field individually or all as a single file. Uh, so what's next? We have all, all of this data, we have this device working, so how, how is this going to help me make my decision about investing in solar? So the standard solar system uses a 250 watt uh, panel. Uh, for our device we use a 25 watt panel. That gives us a ratio of 10. So we did tested this for a week, uh, and our average was uh, 70, 77 watt hours per day. And the conditions for the test were like today, you know, a sunny day, warm day. And using that ratio, that's going to give us uh, 770 watt hours uh, per day with a 250 watt uh, solar panel. All right, um, a five kilowatt uh, solar system uses 20 panels. So once we have that number for one panel, we multiply by 20 panels, which is the uh, five kilowatt system, and this is our number, 15.4 kilowatt hours per day. That's our, you know, our estimate for our solar panel in our location. So this is uh, an actual um, electrical bill for my house, and you see the number up top, it's 379.3 kilowatt hours and that's in 29 uh, billion days. So if we multiply the number that we got on the previous slide times 29 days, that's gonna give us 446.6 kilowatt hours, which is more than you know than we need for you know the electrical usage in my house. So the conclusion of this is that we uh, for my house a five kilowatt system might be enough. And let's do a practical example. Let's say um, you know, in my case, I'm paying, let's say I'm paying $150 a month for my electrical bill. 
uh, that means that it's uh, 1800 per year. And if the five kilowatt system goes about uh, $10,000, that's going to take five and a half years to pay it off. Obviously, this number is going to change. It's going to be different for everyone. It depends on many, many factors, you know, such as weather conditions, uh, your location, and you know, stuff like that. And uh, future works, we want to make our system more accurate. So we want to connect it to uh, the smart meter, uh, you know, from PGE, and that's going to give us more uh, accurate estimates, and as well as doing uh, computer simulations, you know, to simulate all the seasons of the year. So in conclusion, we managed to create a standalone self-sustaining solar monitoring solution that's tailored to you and your rooftop exactly. Um, not only that, but it provides an excellent educational tool uh, to learn about voltage and current and power and everything else. Um, it's actually mounted right outside on that pole, so if you want, after this presentation, you can go outside and look at it. It's collecting real data right now and being presented on our display right there. Um, so, yeah, feel free to look at it. Here are a list of references. And any questions, comments, or concerns? No, not in my house. My house was uh, pretty simple because it's, um, you know, it's white for house. Like, it, we had a difficult uh, time uh, connecting to Wi-Fi here in campus because it's more you know, complex. It's uh, it uses SSA secure, so we have to use, you know, it, it, it's, it's more difficult. I was just thinking, it's connected it's to the enterprise because you mounted it on the roof, right? Yeah. yeah. So oh, we have, uh, yeah. Excellent. Personal users won't have a problem connecting to their home Wi-Fi, but the problem arose when you wanted to connect it to SSM security. So enterprise Wi-Fi has different credentials and security and checks and stuff. So. Somebody else had their hand up like over here. Well, I was just gonna ask, uh, you know, kind of going off that is why not use something more like cellular data versus Wi-Fi? Because you know, one of someone did have that. He was using a hotspot on his phone for a while, but mm -hmm. I actually feel like uh, Feel that maybe Wi-Fi would be more stable, secure. Mm -hmm. so not everybody has hotspots, but everybody has Wi-Fi. So. How do you hook up this uh, solar system that you have to yeah. the PG&E system? Well, that's future works. We plan on looking into it, but it would basically read the number that your smart meter is reading, and then use that in the calculator that we're calculating. So, but uh, you, you are shot an inverter or a converter. On your diagram with some some load here. Over here. This one? I don't very early the presentation. No, we, we don't do that yet. That's we future works. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We, we're planning. we're not that. using an inverter at all. This is data collected straight from the solar panel. <coughs> could you, could you talk a little bit about how you decided to collect the current? Because you look like you're using a current shunt rather than a series. For the, for the sensor or for the... Well, for the, for, I guess it was for, for measuring the power out of the panel. But you're charging the battery. So, so the, we're using a 0.1 shunt resistor, which we then measure the voltage drop across that resistor. And that's how we calculate voltage current and power. But you actually switched it to a shunt, uh, to a parallel shunt resistor at some point. You had a relay in there that you could the relay switches the current to flow into the yeah, to flow into the into the shunt resistor. So, so basically, the time that it takes to take a measurement is between five to ten seconds, and the rest of the time it's charging the battery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> there there somewhere. Yeah, no, it's 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 pretty. Oh, well. Yeah. Okay, so we have the, the relay, and then when the relay opens, it sends, uh, I don't know if you, can, oh, you can't really see it, but the shunt resistor is in series with the load. So we have the load resistor, which sets our load to the solar panel, but then we have the shunt resistor that measures the voltage current and power. So the load is really just the way you're measuring the discharge on the battery, not really measuring the current. It's charging the battery. No, we're not measuring current to charge the battery. Uh, we're measuring the 
current coming from the solar panel? The current coming from the solar panel at that maximum power point. At that maximum power point. At the load where the maximum power point is. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, how often do you send the data to the cloud? And also, what's the, your, uh, uh, shall we say, customer feedback? Uh, the customer feedback, uh, we did this in the symposium and most of them really liked it. Uh, they were interested in the product and uh, we are sending right now uh, data every half an hour. But we can change that to an hour or every 10 minutes. Uh, we did half an hour just to save more uh, power. So, you know, every time we're on the code, we you know, use more battery. So we use you know, half an hour. So I don't have solar panels in my house now, but I want to go solar. So how, explain to me how this system would help me. Right. So basically, uh, our idea, our goal was to you know, connect one solar panel. In our case, it's, it's a 25 watt solar panel. In your house, you know, we're going to connect to your Wi-Fi, and we're going to collect data for you know, a week, a month, you know, as long as it takes. And Using those numbers, we take an average, and you know, we use a ratio to you know, it depends on, on the type of solar panel that, that, you, that you want, or you know, it depends on the solar panel that we're using. In our case, we're using monocrystal um, mono um, solar, solar cells. And we do it over a span of time, mm -hmm. so we would leave this on your roof for three to nine, <laughs> three to twelve months, and then we would average out how much power you're generating over that span. Are you guys gonna charge me money for it? Just speaking of my son. <laughs> that, but that's the confusion, right? It's a survey system. Yeah, it's, it's not it something. Is. It's something prior to uh, to, to making investment. Right? Uh, can, can you go to the um, power measurement accuracy curve? <laughs> can you go in the wrong way? Am I? Okay. Yeah, go the right way. Yep. <laughs> it's always the clickers, man. Well, you can ask the question already. Well, um, I want you to explain the shape of the power measurement factors. There. So why, why does it look like that? Well, they're just different measurements. Uh, we the x-axis is power in uh, coming out of the power supply, and. That y axis is the power out from the INA 219 sensor, so what the INA 219 sensor was reading, I guess. So, so if x equals y, wouldn't that mean? So, you want if it's accurate, then x equals y at 100% accuracy, right? So, there's actually I know it's a bad graph, but there's actually three lines in here, and two lines are almost overlapping. Um, Okay. Yeah. I, I think that section here, the lower power there. Oh, the bottom is section? A, yes. Yeah. It's definitely wrong. Because when you talk about half a watt, 0 0.48, 0 0.3 watt, and you have this curve there, there is something wrong either with your measurement or with your response. It should be linear. Right. Point three watt is a lot of watts. <coughs> yeah. yeah. And then, uh, if you go to the previous uh, curve, why is it that in the beginning, uh, generally, uh, whenever they, uh, let's say, I'm talking about the starting point, right? And then it uh, starts from, let's say, uh, 30, 30 ampere, and then goes up. Uh, Generally, at low voltage, should you have now the maximum current? Yeah, it, no. should, it should start from some, somewhere up there. Why should, why should it start from 30 ampere instead of you know, starting from, let's say, 1.1 ampere? The curve should really look, uh, I mean, look like that, right? Uh, the beginning I mean, of it is. Uh, that's just how we, we, we took the measurements, those were the readings we got. Right, something is wrong, but it should start from there. This might be a bit of an odd question. Um, I was wondering how sensitive your solar panel is to atmospheric conditions. In 
know, the haze and clouds and everything. And in particular, is it possible that you could put it on a car and drive it around the county, and depending on the readings, you could tell what the cloud cover is doing in the atmosphere? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can, you can certainly do that. Um, so, like, if there was a little bit of haze and like drop by ten percent, yeah. has anybody done that? You know? Yeah, we've had it uh, in sunny days. We've had it in cloudy days. Um, we we had it where it would continuously run the script, so it would continuously update every second. And if you wave your hand over it, it drops. And, I mean, it's it's pretty sensitive. Okay. Yeah. Because the influence of haze on right, yeah, the it's, it's, conditions isn't it's handheld this big, so you can. Put it wherever you want, on a boat, on a car. It's not limited to just rooftops. Yeah, actually, the device that we have right now on you know the pole outside, um, that one has a temperature sensor too. So you know it reads the temperature uh, and the humidity as well. Did you take into consideration at all um, the angle of the solar panel in relation to the sun and how the sun tracks on a particular house or where you might have a solar we did. array installed? We did, but our mounting bracket doesn't have any form of adjustability, so we were just, we would lift, we were we stuck with the angle that the bracket was at, which is like roughly 45 degrees. So. How do companies now that are selling solar systems to you, how do they currently do their audits, you know, to tell you whether it's going to be cost effective or not compared to that method compared to this method? Well, I, I think what they do is they go out initially and they do something similar, but it's a spot test. So they just do it like on the spot very quickly and then say, okay, you're good. You know, but the problem with that is it's instant. It's like, that's it. what if they're on today, but then tomorrow it's raining. So okay. this is more tailored over a certain like, okay. longer more accurate. Time. More accurate, yeah. And it's, yeah. So it's just longer. Mm -hmm. I was curious, uh, what are the programming languages uh, for the uh, data collection, we're using uh, Python um, on the Raspberry Pi, and with that code, we send the data to uh, the cloud. And on the cloud, we're using MATLAB to, you know, generate our graphs and displays. We conducted a, a public survey in which we came to the realization that many of us suffer from asthma, uh, allergies, and other respiratory issues. And we believe this is due to the geographic nature of Sonoma County. As you can see, we are encapsulated by mountainous terrain, causing the trapping and circulation of air, forcing us to suffocate in the smell of fecal matter, smoke, and pollen throughout the year. We also noticed that we lack sufficient methods to measure the air quality around us, as highlighted in green, is the closest EPA supplied air or monitoring station to us and is located in Sebastopol. A reason that there may not be more of these systems near us could be due to the fact that they are extremely expensive. So upon our research, we discovered that there are low cost air quality systems out there, but they do not take into consideration some important factors, such as this first model, the AWARE. It's a low cost air quality system. It's small, it's portable but it lacks the ability to uh, work outdoors. We've also got the Natama weather station, which actually provides an indoor and outdoor capability, but it doesn't provide the sensors uh, necessary to give the people basically uh, a, a, a greater quality of value. 
And the project that actually uh, most resembles ours, the one that uh, provides uh, self-sufficient uh, power, it provides uh, remote access to the data, and it provides, and it seems like the sensors that they use are pretty, uh, are pretty, are pretty good, uh, is the Green Village uh, project. But at a total cost of, well, it says it's low cost, but low cost really means $12,000. So we decided to uh, make our own. So our solution was to design, develop, and implement a low-cost air quality monitoring system for urban environments, as well as <coughs> provide a website in which uh, users and members of the community can access this data. <coughs> so what is air quality? We'll be focusing on our project in two of the six major pollutants, ozone, as well as particulate matter. Going over ozone, there are two types of ozone, good ozone and bad ozone. Good ozone, as everyone may know, is the ozone located in the stratosphere that forms a protective layer uh, that protects us from the U harmful UV rays. Uh, that ozone, on the other hand, also known as ground level ozone, is not uh, secreted directly, but rather a byproduct between a chemical reaction between nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds in the sun. It is also a major component in the summertime smog. Another main pollutant is called particulate matter. Particulate matter is really tiny, small particulates that uh, can be suspended in the air. And we can actually categorize the type of particulates in the air by the diameter and size of the, uh, the particulates. For example, we focus on PM10, which ranges from 2.5 to 10 microns in size. Upon obtaining this data, we can take the average between an eight hour period or a 24 hour period and then implement it into our equation that's applied by the EPA. It's a standardization uh, equation. And what we output is the air quality index, which is the value between 0 and 500. And this can be interpreted as the current quality of the air in that specific uh, pollution. So in order to start designing our product, um, we went off based off of the results that we conducted, talking to the public, seeing what they would like in an air quality station. And from that feedback, we based our marketing requirements. So the system must be self-sustaining. Um, it must be user friendly. It also must bring awareness to the community about the air that they're breathing. breathing. Um, and therefore, we generated these engineering requirements. The system must have a 12 volt lead acid battery uh, running at 18 amp hour. The system will use um, a 100 watt solar panel. We will also use uh, chart JS PHP to visualize the data, and then our database will be using MySQL located on the Sonoma State server. We then designed a high level, high level diagram to outline our process. So our um, system is allocated in three different blocks, power, hardware, and software. In our power block, it consists of the solar panel, charge controller, batteries, and our uh, step-down circuit. It then is powering our Raspberry Pi along with our five sensors, and that is being pushed to the database, and then it will be visualized using P, uh, uh, chart.js, PHP, CSS to visualize the data um, for the community. Here we have the power and hardware uh, block diagram. Pretty similar to what Ronan just stated before. It's a little bit more um, uh, specific. As you can see, the Raspberry Pi is one of the main components as it is, uh, is the central processing unit of the entire system, as well as the power circuitry as it powers the entire system along with the four components that we take our five data readings from, which are the temperature, humidity, particulate, ozone, and CO2. In addition to those major components, there are also many uh, supporting components which, such as the relay board, the step-down converters, the voltage sensors, and these are all the, as well uh, connected directly to the Raspberry Pi. So now we get to the software design. This is the software design for our website. So once we've actually acquired the data, we can access the database using PHP, and then, then we convert it to a JSON format and use JavaScript uh, to make it into arrays. Once we have it in arrays, we use a library nodes as, as Chart.js. Using Chart.js, we can graph and visualize our data. So one of the uh, features, one of the features that we actually wanted to provide was allowing the allowing members of the community to actually uh, uh, look at the historic data acquired by the system. So you can visualize uh, today's data as well as uh, previously, like three months, for example. So in order to understand our system, we first generated um, our power using a uh, so this is generated with MATLAB Simulink. It's under the uh, most ideal conditions for a solar panel, which is at 25 degrees Celsius, irradiance at 1,000 watts per meter squared, and atmospheric density at 1.5. Um, this generated a VMAX of 18.12 volts and a power max at 98.14 watts. 
Um, so when we physically tested our system, we were um, at fault to the environment. So there was a little bit of haze in the sky, the temperature outside was 84 degrees, the atmosphere, density, and the irradiance are unknown. So we generated a Vmax at 18.83 volts and a power max at 35.14 watts. Um, also, in order to... Um, uh, sorry. Um, in order to understand our system, um, we needed to figure out the power consumption of all of the components. Um, so the Raspberry Pi um, uses this uh, CO2 and the temperature and humidity. Um, all of this equates to about 11.8 watts running uh, uh, when it's collecting data. Over a 24 hour period, it takes about 284 watts per hour. Another test that we conducted was once we uh, successfully set up our connection from the Raspberry Pi and created a database onto the Sonoma State server, we, we wanted to test the stability, uh, the stability of, on the receiving side. So what we did is we sent 100 data points over a short amount of period, a short amount of period of time, and to check it to see if we obtain, if we will obtain all that data. And uh, each row basically shows uh, each data point that we sent, and we were successful in receiving 100% of what we sent. Um, so throughout this course, there were a lot of challenges. We're going to look at like, three of the major ones, um, which was network, device power, um, and then calibration. So these are some of the challenges that, and how we overcame them. The first one, as Rona stated, was the network challenge. Once we got the fundamental design and the functions working, we started our testing. And over um, our first overnight uh, stability test, a uh, network error was in which would exit the code and shoot out an error. And this had to be manually reset each time, and then we did not want that. So what we ended up uh, figuring out to combat this issue was to implement a microcontroller system to give power, to control the power to the Raspberry Pi uh, over a in special incremented amount of time. Uh, in addition, we had to set up, configure the Raspberry Pi to connect to the someone say secure Wi-Fi automatically, as well as run our scripts. So in the end, we were successfully able to make the system entirely automated. And if we were missing one data point, we would lose that data point. However, in the next hour, when we're taking the next data point, we would reattempt to uh, connect to that uh, Wi-Fi again and send the data if it is there. Another challenge that we had, as Ron stated before, is the, the very large power number that we were obtaining with our system. As denoted in green, you can see that our system was drawing 11.8 watts over this one hour period. You can see that this, is way more, this was way more than what we desired. And to combat this issue, the first uh, phase we did was to add um, relays to cut the power to the sensors were not in use. As denoted, denoted in red, you can see that it dropped the power from 11.84 watts for the whole hour to only five minutes and 3.96 watts for the rest of the time. Uh, the next thing we did was bringing back the topic of implementing the, the microcontroller, we can see that um, it, it not only made the system more stable and automated, it also made it more um, efficient, successfully bringing the power from 284 watt hours a day all the way down to a mere 26.27 watt hours. Um, so calibration was a challenge and it still is. So our ozone was calibrated in the past and we're not entirely sure how that data has been skewed over a year. Uh, our particulate sensor, it needs about 24 hours to take a full measurement um, because it's an average. And based off of our servos, um, we are a little bit limited to that accuracy. Um, our temperature and humidity, though, is about 90% accurate, um, and we can test that because we have an intended module for that purpose. Um, and then our CO2 is one of our biggest challenges because we do need a concentrated um, container uh, full of nitrogen to calibrate it. Here is our proposed budget. Um, so just a few things is our Raspberry Pi. Um, it's $35, our 100 watt solar panel is all of these components then add up to $586, and our total source budget was about $800. Um, added to those materials is our ozone and part particle sensor. Those were kindly donated by Dr. Mark Perry from the SSU Chemistry Department. Both of those sensors cost about $1,200 uh, to combine, so in order to replicate our system, it would cost about $1,800. So this was our proposed um, schedule uh, when we um, did it back in November, and unfortunately, due to all of those challenges, this is what our schedule actually turned out to be. So all of these red blocks are, are just the challenges that we have 
previously talked about. So, in conclusion, we were successfully able to create a low cost air quality monitoring system for urban environments as well as make it self sustainable using our solar panels. And we were able to develop and implement our website in which you can visualize our data as well as acquire the EPA standard air quality index. So for some future work that we had in mind if we were continuing to work on this was to improve the system by implementing a, net, a mesh network system by using microcontrollers and Zigbee's for data transmission to a, a base station that's located in a safe area. We would also like to research, test, and implement other sensors to take measurements of other pollutants such as uh, nitrogen, di nitrog nitrogen dioxide, uh, carbon monoxide, and such. We would also like to research and develop uh, other calibration techniques to further improve our accuracy. We also, over the process of our journey, uh, we were also able to generate two tutorials, and if you would like to learn more about it, uh, you can stop by with me afterwards. Uh, to conclude this project, we would like to thank the Electrical Engineering Department for the support and guidance throughout this process. Uh, we would also like to thank our faculty at Park, Dr. Farid Perriman, and our um, industry advisor, uh, Chris Hales, uh, and the Corrette Scholars Award, excuse me. Questions and comments? Um, so I guess the, so the total air quality station for parts would be about eight hundred dollars. Say the city council at Norman Park is really interested and wants to make five. Mm -hmm. um, how much of your time do you think that would take? Would it be a month for all of you or five months for all of you? Uh, for the most part, we have all the software and everything done. We would just have to recreate the hardware, and we would probably use, use other sources rather than creating your own acrylic box, which took a lot longer than I expected. So, uh, yeah, it could be pretty quick, actually, as long as we have all the, the hardware and components. And we can just easily implement the, the new uh, stations into our, our, our website, basically. We can just have more, uh, more information, more tabs, basically. So, pretty quick is a month or six uh, months? I'd say within a month, yeah. A month of hardware. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir? So it's interesting you mentioned about the mesh network, you know, for the future roadmap. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any kind of a research analysis, what kind of uh, mesh you would like to recommend, uh, especially for a six row pan or something like that? Mm -hmm. I mean, oh yeah. That? Uh, currently, we have not looked too far into it. We just know it, it, it is an idea that we would like to look forward into the future. Uh, uh, being similar to you know, the Stone Cold uh, project that presented earlier, they communicated through Zigbee's, and that is a low power, a long distance communication. Yeah, Laura is one of the things we can make in the future. It's a low range communications problem in case you have planning. Okay. It's just a suggestion. Okay. Um, do you want to just talk about the value of having it solar powered and all the issues that come with the powering versus something that has more accessible power? What's the value between those two settings? The green project setting, perhaps, green having the, 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 the village green project versus having it just on top of a, a roof somewhere? Hi. <laughs> So talking about solar power, we, the, the solar panel that we actually had it was generating way too much power for our actual usage. So we're actually our system is actually self-sustainable, just like the green music, I mean sorry, the green village center uh, project. Sorry. Uh, and um, well, uh, if we had an actual like, resourceful power, I guess from like a wall outlet, we would also we would improve the price by a little bit. Our, our power circuit was very. Beneficial. No, I, I guess I'm asking, what's the value of having it? Uh, on a building somewhere versus having it in the village green. So, so are you saying like the, because like the green village, like the green village project is just like a air quality station, that's well, a self-sustaining air quality station, um, I guess they just put it in the parks or somewhere. And you're saying like we could put it on buildings? Well, I, I guess the, the village green project had a concept of putting it somewhere where kids were playing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And versus having it out of the way on top of the building where you're really not measuring where people move around. Well, actually, that is the same goal that we're having. The, we have the same goal as the Green Village Projects. We want to put, uh, 
implement these systems on public areas such as you know bus stops, um, city parks, and such. So it's kind of the same. It's very similar. It's just low cost. We're trying. To, we're trying to make it low cost, yeah. and not just bus. Okay. Sorry about that. Yes, you. Um, I was just maybe I missed it, but in the calibration, there is there some kind of service that would have to go along with it. How often do you have to calibrate it? Uh, so you have to recalibrate the airflow. That one um, requires it being sent back to the manufacturer who is part of the takeoff. Uh, for the particulate sensor, all it really needs is direct light going into the two holes in the top. Um, but since this is our first prototype, um, we are limited to our servos. Um, and the CO2 would need to be calibrated with like a known quantity of ppm, like 400, which is healthy air, and then probably about 1,000 ppm, which is bad air. So that's how we would calibrate, but getting a hold of those specified quantities is pretty expensive. And we just didn't have enough budget. Okay. So what would the intervals be on those kind of corrections? And then that just to kind of uh, go back to his, that may be it being in a public place rather than not into a building and probably make it easier for those calibrations as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the time interval would be. Because the overall goal for the project is not for 100% accuracy, but rather say 90, 95% range, and it is to spread awareness to the community, to uh, spread knowledge of what air quality is and what the air they are breathing is, how the quality is. So it's like educational purpose. Since it is low cost, you can easily replicate it and also put it in different locations throughout the community, and based off of that, if we do implement the data, it would give an average. So did you compare your values with some another much more expensive or accurate machine to validate how good was the mission that we were taking with the system? Oh, are you asking if we were, if we compared it? Yes, I'm comparing yeah. with a reference system where you can validate who would or bad. Because in my opinion, those low cost and quality sensors are useless because you get really useless data with not good accuracy. So and in some way, it will be excellent to get low-cost sensors mm -hmm. that really provide you a good data. But that um, is really almost impossible nowadays. So I wanted to know, beyond this calibration process that I mean, have been heard, is if you were making some comparison with some reference machines or with the needed weather station that you have for the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. Uh, so we only had a test on two of the sensors which are the ozone, which uh, we calibrated the, uh, the air quality index and we related that to the actual Rona Park's uh, measured air quality index and it was very similar to each other within one or two points. And for the temperature, we have a data logger, which is uh, basically a temperature humidity sensor that is made to measure that specific uh, data. So we found out that it was within 90 to 95% as well. And um, uh, we talked to some advisors and we found out that there was an advisor, Tim Dai, he, he was working on the carbon monoxide sensor too, at low cost. And it was, he said he was having a lot of trouble with it. And it was always giving skewed data. So that was one of our future works to research and implement and understand low, other low cost sensors that could improve. But my feeling is that unfortunately for NO2, SO2, for the other sensors, forget about low cost. Because they have already reference companies like AlphaSense that is well known. We are using them because mm -hmm. and in, in, even using commercial solutions, quite expensive sensors, you don't make a very proper calibration process with mm -hmm. a very good reference system. At the end of the day, whatever you get out of the system is noise. Mm -hmm. And then, mm -hmm. yeah. low, and cost, you keep low cost down by, I guess, switching up the, the higher cost sensors to uh, what the community of that area would need. So I would argue with that. But, you have to be careful with that because other way, you, you, I like you make a tutorial about the random numbers, so you can just use that the random numbers <laughs> when you have a different, the same value that are very low cost air quality sensor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, sort of a uh, little bit of response to that. Uh, the sensors that uh, you guys were using, um, as you know, were already compared to some of the EPA sensors um, by Mark. You know, Track fire and so they are. They were um, a good approximation of the higher cost sensor. 
And we've also, this summer, um, been talking about taking this and co-locating with EPA certified air quality station. So that comparison is online. Okay. Yes? You said when um, you would push the data to the server, if it didn't connect to the Wi-Fi, you wouldn't send. Mm -hmm. um, are you guys still recording that data locally? So on the next time you actually connect, you push that data? Oh, yes. Um, actually, we, uh, we created, we were adding it to a CSV file uh, where it saved on locally. And, well, we haven't had, to, had a chance to implement a, a protocol where if it realizes it's missing a data point, it would send it to two on the next track. However, uh, you can manually go on to the local uh, storage and review the, the data points. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyone else?